As we begin our story, we are swiftly introduced to our main character, Irene. She stands outdoors, casting a curious glance through the window into her own home. Her heart races as a mixture of shock and disbelief washes over her. She can see her own sister, Riel, and she was having an affair with her fiancé. Looking back, Irene realizes something important. She was confronted with unmistakable red flags, yet she brushed them aside. Some examples. Her fiancé would regularly come out of Riel's room, her sister's room. He would secretly visit her and often go on walks with her sister. Even the servants working in the mansion were whispering about them. It was a high time to see the world without the rose-colored filter anymore. There's no mistaking Irene's intense frustration as she rushes down the staircase. She admits that she wanted to pretend the issue wasn't there because she was afraid it would make everything more confusing. But she's come to the point where she's willing to accept what's real. It happened more than once since they were little. Her sister had a habit of taking things of hers. We see a younger Riel and a younger Irene. They were born on the same day, which makes them twins. Her sister, however, was weak from her birth. And because of that, everything in Irene's life changed according to her sister. Riel always needed all of the attention, and Irene needs, well, they were often unnoticed by their parents. It was on her 11th birthday that she realized how bad it actually was. The sister and her had the same birthdays. But it was always Riel who gets to blow the candles, gets picked up and receives cheers. It doesn't feel fair. Irene wants to feel special on her day too, but when she tries to talk to her mom, her mom just gets annoyed at her. It seems like Riel always needs to be in the spotlight. Irene's mom would ignore her and accuse her of being selfish. Her mom felt that since Irene is the oldest, she should act more responsible. Irene's face shows that she's unhappy. She doesn't speak up and keeps her emotions inside. The birthdays always went according to Riel's wishes. On that day, Irene only wanted to say something nice to her sister for her birthday, but she never got the chance because it wouldn't matter what she would think. We see Riel getting many gifts, but there are none for her sister. Riel notices her sister is unhappy, and oddly, she appears to be taking pleasure in the displeasure of her own sister. There's even a smile on her face. In an instant, Riel doesn't appear to be well, and she passes out. Riel is on the cold floor. The atmosphere suddenly transforms into a chaotic scene as her parents, alerted by the alarming sight, react with urgency. They raise their voices, calling out for her desperately. Panic courses through the air as her family, now fully aware of the dire situation, rush to her side. Her father, well, with an anxious determination etched across his face, scoops up his youngest daughter, cradling her in his arms. They're preparing a carriage to bring his youngest daughter to the hospital, leaving Irene behind all by herself. When the birthday party ended that day, Irene was neglected even more. After six years in the Royal Academy that the girls joined late due to the younger sister's health, Irene had very little hope. It all started off on a positive note though. Irene's classmates were all really friendly and supportive, giving her class notes when she couldn't attend. She would actually be making friends for the first time, or so she thought. Riel saw her sister making more friends, and it bothered her. She wanted to be the center of attention, not only at home, but also at school. She was determined to deal with this. After a little while, Irene began to see her friends acting oddly, distancing themselves from her. Something didn't feel right. She had just started to make friends, and now it looked like that had been taken away as well. She tried asking her sister, because she had a feeling she was somehow involved in all of this. However, Riel simply smiled and remarked that her so-called friends were just being immature and couldn't connect with her older sister. She brings their mom into the conversation, saying she's concerned about Irene isolating herself. 
Irene felt that something was wrong and was completely sure the sister was behind it, but she couldn't bring herself to get mad at her. She has to consider Riel's health because Riel is weak and delicate, so she says she always had to be the good sister. Even after the girls graduated from the academy, their father couldn't leave the mansion to look after Riel, but then one day, Irene met him. It was on a banquet she attended on her father's behalf. A cheerful young man appears, introducing himself to Irene as Boris Garten. Irene seems really impressed. The young man is very good looking and well-mannered after all. So after some time passed, the couple would spend more time with each other. They'd often have tea in the garden. Boris knew about the entire situation and treated Irene kindly. He was always by her side. It seemed like a dream. <laughs> At least Boris popped a big question and decided to propose. It caught Irene off guard at first, but she asked herself if losing Boris would result in always being in her sister's shadow. Well, with a constant feeling of being manipulated like a puppet, so she decided to go along with it, and delightfully, she accepted the proposal. As if her life depended on it. Unfortunately, this was not only about her feelings. The family was on the verge of bankruptcy, so the engagement ceremony was hurriedly held. We see Boris and Irene. Boris seems to be ready for the next step, but Irene tells him she's not ready yet. Boris replies that he has respect for his fiance, so he'll wait until she's ready. Boris looks embarrassed and says it's not what it looks like. It's a misunderstanding. Irene is crushed. Is this the result of the sacrifices and care she's shown? Riel asks her older sister not to get angry and says there is nothing going on between her and Boris. Irene won't pretend not to know anymore. She's completely convinced it's not a misunderstanding. All the feelings and stress are getting to Riel. She doesn't feel good and is about to faint. Boris is worried and yells, asking if she's okay. She appears to have tears in her eyes and focuses her attention to her older sister. She tells her she should know better. There's nothing going on between them. Listening to the lies just makes Irene angrier. She knows what she was. Riel was locking eyes with her and now she's denying everything. This moment marks a real turning point in their relationship. Irene makes it unequivocally clear that she no longer wishes to be addressed as a sister. Their bond is broken. Boris gets upset and tries to stand up for Riel by saying Irene is being too much. But Irene isn't finished. She tells Boris to go away, to leave her life. Then she takes off her engagement ring and throws it away. She's ending things with him as well. From now on, Irene is going to live her life for herself. She won't listen to what others say now. She's her own individual. Irene gets a friendly greeting from her family's butler, who has been serving the family for years. He gets the order to move all of Irene's belongings to the third floor. The butler is feeling puzzled because all of this is happening so suddenly, and he's curious about what happened. He thinks Lady Riel wants to switch rooms. We find out that Riel has switched rooms before because of the medicine smell. Irene is really irritated. People are already making it out about her sister. Doesn't what she wants matter for once? She does her best to stay composed. She realizes why the butler is assuming this, as she usually follows her sister's lead, but this time is different. Irene just says no. She tells the butler her younger sister will stay on the second floor. She only wants her things moved to the third floor right away. The butler is surprised. He got it all mixed up. He wants to know if her mom knows about this. Irene says she's not a seven-year-old anymore. She doesn't need anyone's permission. They're getting Irene's stuff ready to go to the third floor. Her books, clothes, and all that. Irene has another maid take her things to the upper floor the next day. She's excited about the move because it means her sister won't be in the room next to hers. She wants to keep her sister at a distance and enjoy some privacy for a change. Irene is in her new room, busy putting her books and stuff away. Something in the room catches her eye, but she can't reach it in time. She hears a loud knock on the door. It makes Irene anxious. Who's making so much noise? Well, it's Irene's mother, and she is extremely, extremely angry. She slaps her daughter in the face without any regret and calls her a disrespectful wench. Boris told their mom everything. 
And now she's accusing Irene of causing her sister to faint, saying Riel was on the verge of death. We notice some marks on Irene's face. Her mom really hurt her. She caused genuine damage. But this time, Irene will not stay silent. It's time to stand up for herself. She explains it can't be her fault. She didn't make her sister sick. This isn't how Irene usually responds. And her mom remarks on it. Riel is still Irene's sister and not just a stranger. Irene decides to express thoughts she'd had for a long time. Do they have to be sisters just because they share the same parents? Why does she always get everything? It's always been this way. She had to give up everything for Riel's sake. Irene is reflecting on the sacrifices she had to make. Like parents' love, everyone's attention, friends. And now, Irene even took away her fiancé. Her mother sighs and concedes that she can now see how lonely it must have been for her all this time. Is her mother starting to understand? But as expected, it was too good to be true. Mother brings up Riel again and insists that Irene should see her immediately because she's probably lonely. After all those years, Irene finally had a glimmer of hope only for it to be shattered once again. Irene instantly lets go of her mother's hand. She says she'll see her sister later, but wants to be alone for now. She pulls her mother away from the room and closes the door. Irene is devastated, feeling foolish for thinking her mother would actually take her side for once. It was all too good to be true. Irene's eyes fill with tears. She has to accept that Riel will always come first, no matter what. On top of that, it seems like even the second place is reserved for her sister as well. It's not anything new to learn though, but she feels guilty for expecting things to be different. She was hoping for too much. This isn't what she wanted, but it seems like things will never change. Irene realizes it's been a while since she expressed her emotions. She's still sitting on the floor, gazing at the stars outside. There are things left to unpack. Irene notices her old drawings. Then a memory resurfaces. Her sister fainted once while she was drawing. And after that, she wasn't allowed to draw anymore. It seems ridiculous. Another sacrifice she had to make. Is this how she has to live her life? Is this what she needs to do to be the part of the family? Irene wonders if they were ever family to begin with. She realizes that things can't go on like this. She needs to get out. Out of the house. Away from from this family, away from her family. But what can she really do? Irene explains that the Chase family has a long history. Wherever they go, they get interrogated by the military. To persuade the knights, they agree on a deal to avoid legal restrictions. The only way she could escape from this family is through marriage. There's a massive castle and two men are engaged in a discussion. They look very wealthy. It's unclear what their conversation is about. One man says the other guy's suggestion doesn't seem logical. The other man explains it's the only idea he can come up with. What else can they do? He's thinking about approaching them for advice. But who are them? Who are they? Who is he referring to? Well, his friend agrees. He's ready to ask for help. We're now introduced to Noel Kirsten as he browses through old family pictures. Regrettably, he describes himself as the product of a mistake made by Archduke Kirsten. Noel is revealed to be the Archduke's illegitimate child, a bastard boy. The Archduke's eldest son was set to inherit everything. But soon after the Archduke's death from illness, his eldest son had a fatal hunting accident while riding a horse. All of a sudden, Noel became the only heir, but life had never been easy for him because his grandfather had never acknowledged him. All the way to the end, his grandfather set the tough conditions to block Noel from inheriting the family fortune. One of those conditions was to find a girl and get married. Noel is deep in thoughts, wondering who would be interested in him given that he was born out of wedlock. He was a bastard boy. 
It's a bright morning and Irene is preparing to join her family for breakfast. She's feeling a touch of anxiety as she approaches the room, aware that the atmosphere won't be the most welcoming. After taking a deep breath, she enters and apologizes for being a little late. As anticipated, all her family members are giving her the silent treatment. The room is quiet and her parents don't appear to be happy. They are intentionally ignoring their older daughter. Irene tells herself it's fine. She no longer craves her family's affection. After a while, Riel stands up and goes over to her elder sister. She reiterates that she fainted yesterday, but instead of expecting an apology, she tells Irene that there's no need for one. Irene isn't impressed, wondering why she would apologize. She has no regrets about her actions. Irene points out that her sister doesn't seem to understand and questions why she's acting like the victim. Irene's mother is losing her cool and expresses her anger. She shouts at Irene and immediately comes to Riel's defense. Irene decides to confront her sister again about the whole incident. She kissed her fiancé. Riel becomes nervous and struggles to find the right words. Their father stands up and angrily asks Riel if it's true. Tears then well up in Riel's eyes, obviously crocodile tears, and she finally confesses to her actions. She breaks down and apologizes, explaining that jealousy got the best of her. Riel admits she's not very outgoing, which made her envious, especially because she'd never been in a relationship before. Her parents quickly start to feel sorry for her, showing their support to make things even more complicated. Riel accuses Boris of seducing her? Her father expresses his understanding, while the mother instructs the servants to bring a blanket for Riel. Irene is taken aback by the situation, as it seems her parents are once again supporting Riel in her lies. Ah, she wonders if this is all she's meant to be for her parents, even in this situation, yet again. But it makes sense for her wounds to be overlooked in this house. Irene decides she wants nothing more to do with her family. But in order to get away from them, she needs to find a husband first. Irene checks with one of the maids if there are any invitations for her today. The maid agrees to check, but mentions she needs to assist Riel first. This bothers Irene, and she insists on being the top priority, emphasizing her orders as she's speaking to her personal maid. She decides that henceforth, the servants should not overlook her. Irene requests to see all the letters she hasn't received yet today and plans to try on various dresses. Irene examines the invitations she has received, which include a tea party, a banquet, and balls. These events provide her with the perfect excuse to leave the house and search for a potential husband. Irene was never able to attend such gatherings because she was always responsible for looking after her little sister. She, well, she had a proper debut. She hadn't had that yet. Irene reads one of the invitations. There's a banquet tonight at Duchess Jasmine's mansion, and it's a great opportunity to attend since many people will be there. The maid enters Irene's room with the dresses she requested. Irene selects the yellow dress and asks the maid to assist her in putting it on. She adores the dress for its comfortable and contemporary design that complements her dark hair and eyes. When Irene gazes at herself in the mirror, she can't believe her eyes. Is that really her? She looks genuinely pretty today. And she's thrilled to dress up and feel beautiful for once. Just like Riel does every day, the maid compliments Irene on how beautiful she looks. Irene expresses her gratitude to the maid, delighted with the assistance that she gave her. She had specifically chosen this skilled maid because she had observed her helping her sister so many times before. As Irene gets ready to depart, she requests a carriage for her journey. However, just as she's about to leave, both Riel and her father make an appearance. Riel instantly notices Irene's dress and compliments her on how amazing she looks. She seems a bit nervous and Irene can't help but notice. Riel asks Irene where she's going, to which Irene responds that she's headed to a banquet. Riel finds Irene's sudden interest in attending such events peculiar and can't help but wonder why she's going. 
Irene decides to not keep the truth from them and admits that she had never attended these events before because she had to be there for Riel. However, things have changed now and she no longer feels the need to do so. Irene confidently asserts that she can manage on her own and departs, leaving Riel behind, watching with a hint of dismay in her eyes. Irene is determined to forge her own path and although she is proud of her newfound independence, she can't help but feel a touch of sadness. It marks one of the rare occasions when she has had to say no to Riel. Yet, it's only when she escapes the confines of her gloomy family home that she can truly taste the freedom that she's been longing for. Irene reaches the Duchess's mansion after a while, with the explicit goal to meet new friends, make new friends, and become more acquainted with the world beyond her home. As she enters the room, an announcement is made. Introducing Irene Chase, the daughter of the Chase family. As each lady's name is announced upon entering the giant room, it becomes apparent that a large number of wealthy individuals have turned out for this specific occasion. Irene, who typically avoids these sort of gatherings, suddenly finds herself at the center of attention. Her absence from previous events has sparked rumors, including unkind speculation about her appearance. Overwhelmed by her nervousness and the feeling that people are discussing her, Irene finds herself in a tense situation. Suddenly, a young lady with red hair approaches her, offering words of comfort. She advises Irene not to feel intimidated by anyone. This young lady identifies herself as Jasmine, the host of the party, and expresses her delight at Irene's attendance. She believes that the event will become the talk of the town. Irene graciously thanks her for the invitation and introduces herself in return. Curious about what Jasmine meant by the talk of the town, Irene quite inquires. Jasmine clarifies that Irene has always been somewhat of a mystery, so her presence at the party suggests its importance. Jasmine warmly invites Irene to join her at the table, and Irene accepts with pleasure. This opportunity will undoubtedly make it easier for Irene to meet new people and establish new friendships. Jasmine proceeds to introduce Irene to her circle of friends. The girls gather around the table, we're all part of wealthy families, and their curiosity leads them to ask Irene about her family background. Irene can't help but wonder if all these people only care about the family, lineage, wealth, and influence. The conversation takes an interesting turn when one of the girls mentions hearing a rumor that Lord Noel might be attending the party. Irene's interest is piqued. She listens intently as the girls discuss Lord Noel's situation. As the conversation continues, one of the girls reveals that Lord Noel is expected to marry a woman who gains the Archduke's approval in order to secure his inheritance of his father's title. However, the girls find the idea of him marrying a bastard laughable. Even Jasmine joins in with some light-hearted remarks, suggesting that Lord Noel would be perfect if he had the right bloodline. Irene starts to feel increasingly irritated by the shallowness of their focus on bloodlines and backgrounds. While listening to their conversation, Irene can't help but wonder if people have ever spoken about her in such a manner. Irene begins to empathize with Lord Noel's situation, feeling a sense of compassion for him, as he's discussed in such a callous manner, so disrespectfully. A waltz begins to play, and the ladies kindly invite Irene to join them. She starts to feel a little shy and is on the verge of declining their offer. A commotion breaks out, with two men raising their voice in an argument. Among them is Lord Noel, engaged in a heated dispute with a rather intoxicated companion. Irene quickly realizes that one of the arguing men must be Lord Noel, though he doesn't quite match her preconceived image of him. The man under the influence of alcohol openly ridicules Lord Noel, labeling him a scandalous love child and boldly claiming that he's unfit to ever hold the title of Archduke. Lord Noel's patience wears thin. 
As his initial purpose at the event was far from enduring such insults, Lord Noel becomes aware of the chatter surrounding him. The decision to attend the party begins to appear quite regrettable. Choosing to keep his emotions in check, he offers an apology to the drunken stranger. However, the drunken man remains dissatisfied with the apology and proceeds to demand that Lord Noel kneel to him. The tension between the two men has drawn the attention of the entire gathering, and people are growing increasingly anxious. Lord Noel cuts the argument short, stating he has prior commitments and needs to leave. Overwhelmed by the awkwardness, the drunk man falls silent, deciding to drop the issue. Irene's stomach turns as she listens to the people's remarks. Puzzled by their utter lack of compassion, the folks at the party, they really lack compassion and love. They enjoy talking about other people's troubles. The party's atmosphere has taken a toll on Irene. She's had enough of the party and wants to leave. She's disgusted by how people are treating each other. Sitting on a bench outside, she reflects on what just happened. An archduke from a questionable background, hated by his family. Seeing him all by himself, no one to help him. Irene feels like she can relate to him. She can understand how he must feel. But what if they could help each other? Irene starts to think. She's sure she can help him, at least. There might be a small issue, though. Her fiancé Boris didn't accept the request to break off the engagement yet. And even she tried to sell all of her paintings. It would be easy finding a broker in secret. If Irene could only convince Lord Noel to marry her, he'll be able to inherit his title. And Irene, she'd be finally free from her family. If they could both reach their goals, then would it matter if they weren't in love? Irene gives it some more thought. She realizes it's not going to be easy. She wonders where no Lord Noel ran off to. It appears that Irene got lucky. The Lord is in the garden too, and he senses her. And Irene, caught off guard, becomes incredibly nervous and can't find the right words. Believing he might be in her path, the Lord says sorry and steps aside. Irene grabs his arm and offers her help with a straightforward approach. Lord Noel is taken aback, unsure of how to respond. He's puzzled by the girl's statement. He just can't believe it. Irene's grip on his arm leaves him feeling uneasy and anxious. He reassures her that he's not going to escape so she can release him. Irene had noticed she was still gripping his arm and quickly lets go of him. She offers him an apology, explaining that she didn't intend to cause Lord Noel any discomfort or harm. She continues, emphasizing that her offer to assist him is genuine. Irene mentions that she's aware of the rumors surrounding the Lord, as they've circulated widely. Lord Noel nods, acknowledging the rumors have been rampant. He admits that it's a challenging situation that he's found himself in. With a compassionate look, Irene suggests she's well informed about his inheritance situation, and Lord Noel visibly startles, indicating his frustration with the rumors. Lord Noel reveals that he had a discussion about his title inheritance with his grandfather just the day before, yet the information has somehow reached the public so rapidly. It's clear, and crystal clear, that grandfather spread all the rumors too. Irene hesitates, but realizing this might be her only opportunity, she plows on. She continues by opening up about her own quest for a partner, emphasizing her desire for a marriage that would provide an escape from her family. The Lord finds it perplexing why Irene would wish to distance herself from her home. Irene explains that achieving her goal won't be easy, considering the fact that she's still in an engagement. The Lord expresses his curiosity about Irene's intentions. She then articulates her understandings that he's in the search of a bride. It finally dawns on Lord Noel that Irene is, in fact, proposing herself as a potential wife. She emphasizes to the Lord that her decision stems from necessity. However, Lord Noel remains somewhat suspicious, cautioning Irene that if her motivations revolve solely around his wealth, she should reconsider her proposition. Irene sighs, making it clear that wealth is the last thing she's looking for. All of a sudden, Lord Noel moves closer, lifting Irene's chin up gently, and su he suggests that, you know, she shouldn't expect a marriage filled with love with him. Irene tells him 
She doesn't require love. This isn't about seeking power. And she won't demand anything from the Lord. Not money, not love, nothing. She doesn't want anything. Lord Noel recognizes that Lady Irene is genuinely committed to this proposal, which catches him by surprise. Lady Irene starts to cry. Feeling overwhelmed, all she desires is the formal union of a marriage. She's experienced love in the past only to be betrayed. There's no point in dwelling on the past heartbreaks. With no escape or hiding place, she's determined to keep her promise to herself, to live a life without regrets. Irene firmly believes that she can rescue one another. Later that evening, as Irene prepares to return to the mansion, she's overwhelmed by the audacity of her actions and words in front of a nobleman. She can't help but feel foolish. She thinks about finding another way out and recalls her talk with Lord Noel. We catch a glimpse of Lord Noel's thoughts. He's still skeptical. The idea of saving each other seems like a romantic notion. Why should he place trust in a stranger he just met? Lord Noel apologizes for being so cautious, but he needs to be careful. There are many enemies out there who would love to see him fail. Upon consideration, Lord Noel ponders the situation. Why would a young lady suddenly appear and offer her help? It just doesn't make any sense. He ponders and ponders on it. Why would she include the prospect of marriage? It does raise some suspicion. Lord Noel is thinking if Irene might be sent by someone, but we don't know who he's talking about just yet. Lord Noel carefully examines Irene. From her outward appearance, she seems like a normal, innocent lady from a respectable family. It just doesn't make any sense, you know? She just offers this to him. And I mean, she looks kind of uncomfortable. It looks like she's not really used to wearing makeup and her dress isn't fitted either. Irene just feels totally uncomfortable to him. Irene wants to ensure the Lord that he comprehends her commitment. She clarifies that she's the elder daughter of Count Chase and a graduate of the Royal Academy. No one has sent her for instructed reasons. To do this, it's entirely her initiative. She offers the Lord an opportunity to conduct an investigation on her background, emphasizing that she has nothing to hide. Lord Noel pauses to understand everything. He asks Irene about her unwavering determination. Irene clarifies that she wishes to avoid making the same mistakes. Unexpectedly, Lord Noel excuses himself, stating that he needs to leave. Irene has more to express, but it's too late, and Lord Noel swiftly turns and departs. Irene is in the carriage heading home. She's unsure if her efforts were sufficient, but she did her best. It's now up to the Lord to respond. Since he hasn't given a clear answer, there's still a chance. Out the blue, something outside the carriage grabs her attention. She tells the driver to stop so she can see what's going on outside. In the dim light, Irene makes her way into a building. It's revealed to be a shop. She decided to discreetly save money. It's an ideal time since she's already out and has the opportunity. Irene receives a warm welcome from the shop owner upon entering and she asks if she's looking for a particular item. Irene, however, clarifies that she has no intention of making a purchase during this visit. She has brought one of her paintings with the intention of having it appraised. The shop owner attentively examines the painting, his keen eye assessing the artwork that she's made. The shop owner carefully examines the paintings, taking his time to look at all the small details. Irene finds herself growing increasingly anxious as she watches him inspect the paintings. This piece holds significant sentimental value to her. She had to hide her paintings from her father, which made it a long and difficult process to finish. The shop owner reaches his verdict, and it's a pleasant surprise. He happily informs Irene that the painting is excellent, praising the colors, shading, and the emotions it conveys. Irene is astounded that someone appreciates her painting. However, she doesn't reveal that she's the actual artist. The shop owner goes on to say that the person who created it has a keen eye for detail, even taking great care in painting the tiniest elements. He promptly offers Irene 12 gold pieces as a reward. The shop owner expresses gratitude to Irene for her visit, which prompts Irene to reflect on her journey towards independence. Irene doesn't shy away from the long road ahead, but rather she sees this encounter as a hopeful beginning. Her heart swells with pride, especially considering that this marks the first instance of her earning her own money from her artwork. What's even more special is that someone truly liked her creative work, making her really, really happy. 
Home at a reasonably late hour, Irene carries a touch of disappointment. Ah, <sighs> her expectations weren't high for a warm welcome home from the family, yet she had hoped to find at least one person waiting for her. Exhausted, Irene trudges towards the stairs. Feeling the weight of the day, her eyelids are heavy. She's on the verge of drifting off when she suddenly hears her name. It's her sister. Still awake and taken aback by Irene's late arrival, Irene actually flinches in response. Now we move over to Lord Noel's grand mansion. He's asked a servant to learn about Lady Irene. The butler shares what he found. Lady Irene Chase is the oldest daughter of Count Chase. She lived with her aunt until she was three and went to the Royal Academy from age 17 to 21. Lord Noel is curious about why she began at 17, as most girls usually start at 16. The servant clarifies that they couldn't pinpoint the exact reason, but it appears that she might have started a bit later so she could attend school at the same time as her younger sister, Lady Riel. She was also able to take care of her more that way. Lord Noel appears lost in thought. Is Lady Irene looking after her sister? Is her sister unwell? The servant goes on to explain that their effort to gather information was much harder than they expected. They did manage to find some of Irene's former classmates, but those classmates didn't want to talk too much about her. In addition, there's not much info available about her wildly known. This makes it tough to learn about her past, her activities, or even her connections. So the servant faced some challenges in trying to uncover details about Lady Irene's life, leaving Lord Noel still curious about who she is and why she's made the choices that she has. The servant tentatively proposes the idea of dispatching someone to Lady Irene's manor in order to gather some more information. But Lord Noel isn't sure about that idea. He's concerned that sending someone else might not be the best approach in this situation. So, he tells his butler to write a letter to the manor and decides he'll go there himself. The butler is somewhat taken aback by this decision, as it's highly uncommon for the lord to take such direct action. But Lord Noel is really curious and wants to find out more about Lady Irene on his own. Lord Noel asks his servant if there is more to share, sensing the servant wants to say something. The servant mentions the earlier question about finding a bride at the party, and how Lord Noel's response was a bit mysterious. The servant is now curious about why Lord Noel is so interested in Lady Irene. Lord Noel looks annoyed and refuses to answer the question. The servant realizes he made a mistake, apologizes, and promptly leaves the room. We find Lord Noel gazing at a book, lost in thought about Irene. He wonders about this mysterious young lady. Was she genuinely serious about her offer? Back at the mansion, Riel approaches Irene, explaining that she waited for her because she was out for a long time. She compliments her sister's looks and wonders if there were many men interested in her. Although she showers Irene with compliments, Irene seems unconvinced and tired, just wanting to go to bed. As Irene is about to pass her sister, Riel suddenly grabs her arm and her demeanor shifts entirely. Riel suggests that Irene has changed and asks if she's still upset about Boris. Riel attempts to persuade her sister that whatever happened was a good thing, as it revealed Boris's true character. She believes Irene should be grateful for this insight. Irene, however, doesn't want to hear any of it and tells her sister to stop, as she's had enough. Riel expresses that it's painful for her when she gets ignored and admits that she's in pain and suffering. Irene finds it difficult to respond to her sister, but chooses to speak up. She tells Riel to stop using her illness against her, as it's not fair. Riel seems confused. So, Irene clarifies that even if she had married Boris without knowing his true self, it's not Riel's problem, and Irene doesn't owe her thanks for it. That would be ridiculous. Riel wants to respond, but Irene cuts her off. She firmly states that she doesn't want to discuss this topic any further. Not now, not ever again. She emphasizes that she's not grateful to anyone. Irene then continues upstairs to her room. Riel appears frustrated, as this wasn't the response that she was hoping for. The maid holds a letter in her hands, and as she starts to look at it, she realizes that it's for Irene. She has a concerned look at her face. She's surprised, as Lady Irene never usually gets any sort of mail or letters from anyone, and it's truly shocking to her. However, behind her, the silhouette of a woman appears, and the poor maid is caught in shock. It's Lady Riel. She asks her if the letter was for her sister. 
The maid exclaims and tells the young lady that she shouldn't be up and about walking, as she should be in bed resting and taking it easy. The lady exclaims and says that she felt lonely without her sister or Irene around and that she was considering going for a walk. The maid falls for this obvious lie and this is when Riel takes the opportunity to ask if the letter is for Irene. The maid instantly falls for her fake kindness and tells her that the letter indeed is for Irene, but that it has no return address, so she has no clue who it's from, and it's the only letter that she's ever received, so she finds it quite interesting and a pure surprise, as the maid happily shares her thoughts on it being quite a nice fact. We see Riel is angry at the thought of seeing a letter for her own sister. It shows in her face that she has a gloomy look of disgust on her ugly grin. I really hate this character. Either way, she proclaims that she will make sure that her sister gets the letter. The maid asks if this is a good idea given her current state. But the lady proclaims that she is fine and that she can handle it. And it's a good way to make amends with her sister. However, the maid says the letter is not of major importance, so it shouldn't be that important for her to do it, and asks that she should please make sure that Irene gets it. Riel, however, grabs the letter and walks off to her room. She opens the letter and reads it, but as she's reading it, it's as if a ghost has entered her dorm. She is caught in a true shock, and to her horror, the letter makes her furious and angry beyond belief. She proclaims, what is this? And smashes the letter into her desk and starts speaking to herself, asking, why not me? In a strange way, as if to say, why did her sister get this particular letter and not her? As if this bitch hasn't gotten 300,000 letters before. God, I hate her. Either way, we switch scenes and see a horse carriage. And inside, we see young Noel who is thinking about Irene. But he also looks outside and he spots a young girl as he approaches. He's told they have arrived. He steps out, but is confused and questions why this woman is in front of him. She says they have been expecting him. It's a realm. The real question is who is she and why is she speaking to him? She doesn't look like a maid. He asks if Lady Irene is at home. Arel, well, says that she apologizes, but her sister is quite busy and her sister told her that she should take care of this situation and take her place for this meeting. Clearly a lie, but still... She says her name is Riel Chase, the younger sister of Irene. He looks at this younger sister and realizes that they look nothing alike at all. One has a smile and a fake posture, while the other seems to have a desperate and lost soul that requires saving. She then goes ahead and asks him what his name is. He says to her his name is Noel Kirsten and asks if this letter reached Irene. She asks if he is Noel Kirsten, the Archduke. He replies yes. She freaks out and says, my goodness, and proclaims that she's a big fan of his. She says that she has heard a lot about him and that he has both skills in literary and military arts. And that most importantly to her, she heard that he is going to be the heir despite being an illegitimate child. This seems to anger Noel. She says that it's truly amazing to meet him and it's an honor. However, he th is thinking to himself that she talks way too much. He asks if there is something going on between her and her sister. But see, she basically just says there is nothing going on. He once again examines her face and he starts thinking to himself about the fact that Irene, compared to this brat in front of him, looked way more tired and broken as a person. Someone who has just suffered. On the other hand, the sister in front of him looks nothing like that. Arel basically says that she sh they should head inside as her parents are waiting for them. Noel once again thinks about the fact that he was told by Irene that she wants to leave this home. As we see the giant mansion he's entering, he thinks about the possibility that perhaps she never even received his letter. We then get to see as Irene is sitting in her room gazing upon the sky while thinking about the Archduke Noel. She wonders if he would trust her after all. She remembers it looking like he was considering the proposition, but if this doesn't work out, she doesn't know what to do now. She starts to consider selling her paintings again, but that wouldn't garner enough money for a luxurious life, and even if she escaped, they would send out search parties for her, and she would never be left alone by her parents. Not because they worry about her, but rather because of Riel. Because if she disappears, then they won't have anyone to look after their precious little Riel anymore. She realizes that the Archduke is her only way out, and she wonders if perhaps she should go and speak to him once more. 
She realizes that sitting around and sulking won't do her any good and decides to go and check with the maids one more time if a letter has arrived. As she exits the room, we see that the maid from earlier is here and she asks her if any letters have arrived for her. The maid says no, she doesn't think so. She asks her again to please check one more time. The maid keeps insisting there was no letter for her until Irene finally gets angry and snaps at the maid and demands her to tell the truth as she can tell that the maid is lying. She demands her to tell her where the letter is and with a determined and angry face, she does it. We see Riel is showing Noelle around the mansion and telling him about her weak heart and that she almost died a few times, trying to make him feel sympathy for her. She says that she's never able to leave her room for more than a day and that this house is all that she knows and that she finds it suffocating. Noelle just replies with, I see, in a sort of downtrodden tone. Riel keeps jabbering on about how she has to make her own destiny, even with her weak heart. Meanwhile, we see as the Archduke frankly doesn't care as to what she is saying and just keeps asking her where Irene is and why he hasn't seen her yet. Her sister then starts bringing up her, mentioning how Irene has always been surrounded by so many people and that she enrolled in the academy late due to her and that she never spent much time together as she was always busy chasing after her older sister. With a smile on her face, she asks him if the matter is nothing more than silly. We do notice how Noelle's thoughts were so far away. All he could think about to himself is how much this girl in front of him is lying. He can tell that she's lying. He can see right through her lies like it's nothing. But that's the problem. He knows. He knows who the real victim is here. She asks Noelle to wait for a bit as she needs to let her parents know that he is here. While waiting, he gets bumped by one of the maids. She apologizes for hitting him but he very gently asks her if she could please wait for a minute and answer a question. He wants to know something. But we don't see what he asks her, but before we know it, he walks into the room and meets Irene and Riel's mother and father as they welcome him. They say that it's a true honor to have his presence in their home, and Noel apologizes for the sudden visit. However, they say it's fine and ask him to sit down for some tea. He thanks them and sits down. Just as he's about to ask where Irene is, he doesn't even have the chance to do it before he's interrupted as the father says, About our dear Riel. Noel is frustrated as his face annoyingly has to utter the words, Yes. He then listens to the parents talk about how her heart and body are weak and that she's a very kind and caring child and that she is so considerate of her sister and that she's never had any real friends. They just keep on gloating about how great Riel is over and over talking about how she always looks out for others. Riel then steps in and tries to play it off as her dad being just too much and showering her with too much praise. He says he has always felt Riel's silent pain and says he feels for his poor daughter Riel. We see the frustration grow even further in Noel as he clenches his fist in pure fury. The father continues and says the fact that Riel took interest in him is amazing, but before he can continue his sentence, he's cut off by Noel. He says that since he's arrived and was let in by Lady Riel, that he spoke to a total of five maids. They ask him what's the deal with that. We see as Riel grabs his suit, but Noel pushes her away, not letting her attach herself to him in any sort of way. She looks frustrated and angry. He continues and says that not a single one of the maids could tell him where Irene is and where she was whatsoever. They didn't even know when Irene had last ate a meal in this house, let alone where she was. They had no issue whatsoever answering that exact same question about Irel, but not a single word about poor Irene. The father asks what this is, why, what is this? Why is he bringing this up? He continues on and says that it seems to him that the only child in this house seems to be Lady Riel. As we see a gloomy look of Riel, she seems to be embarrassed. She's being confronted by hard facts. The father gets more furious and angry than before and asks Noel how he dares to say such things. Noel stops him and says that Lady Irene, is she even really a member of this family? We see Irene running and we also see Noel's thoughts as he's questioning how the hell these people can think so little of her and also how little respect they have for him to have given his letter for Irene over to Riel instead. How could they do that? The door flings open and we see Irene startling a maid that is shocked to see her. She tells her that Lady Riel is currently entertaining a guest. Irene already knows that Riel has gotten her thorns into him and questions if she has already lost him. 
Has she already gotten over him? Has she already destroyed her chances of escape? She fears the worst, and all she can think of is how her parents destroyed her trust, how Riel took their love all to herself, how she took her friends in school away from her, and how she even stole her fiancé. She rushes and tells herself that she can't lose Noel as well. She can't lose him to that witch of a sister as well. She tells herself, please, not him. She can't let Riel take away her last thread of hope. As she faces the door, her heart stops and she creaks it open slowly. She hears the words of Lord Noel. He's saying that it seems almost as if she doesn't even exist, and that nobody here looks out for her. Irene freezes in her tracks. She watches through the creak door as Noel goes on and says that even as her parents, they have done nothing but praise Riel and haven't said a single thing about their eldest daughter, Irene. The father gets angry and says that it's because they have nothing to say about her. Noel questions if it's normal for a parent to have nothing to say about their child. He says he feels sorry for her to have been spending so many years alone in this house with no one on her side. He asks if you can even call this place her home or these people her family. Just because they are blood related, that doesn't make them good parents or close to the word siblings. As he steps up, we see Riel ask him how he dares to say such things. He simply exclaims that if you can't make her happy, that they should at least stop hurting her. He says she's a human being as well, with her own emotions, and he then excuses himself out of the room and decides to leave. On the other side of the door, he lays his eyes upon the woman that he was there to see. On the ground, Irene sits huddled up and crying. But these aren't tears of pain. These are the first ever tears of joy. This was the first time a person had stood up for her. This was the first time somebody called out her family on the horrible abuse and mistreatment they had caused her. Lord Noel looks her in the face as tears stream down. All she can utter are the words, Lord Noel. But before you know it, he grabs her, squeezes her between his arms and hugs her with all the warmth and love that he can muster up. She keeps crying, but he tells her that it's fine. It's okay for her to cry. He says that from now on, he'll be by her side forever. We find Irene laying in bed sleeping, but her eyes aren't able to close as all she can do is think. <sighs> she thinks about how everyone was so mean to her today. She wonders if her mother will ever hug her like she does Riel. She wonders if she should stop crying as otherwise Riel might hear her. She remembers a memory of where Irene is being punished for crying and being told by her mother that she doesn't have it as hard as Riel, so she shouldn't be crying. She tells her that she should lead by example. But Irene, all she can do is hold in her tears. Her mother attacks her for crying so much. We see Riel asking her mother to look after her drawing, but, well, Irene is being pushed away in the meantime. We once again see Noelle holding poor Irene in his arms, and all she can think to herself is the fact that she has never been able to cry in someone's arms before. She notices how soft and warm his hands are. He asks her if she's feeling any better. She says, oh yes, she is fine with a cute demeanor, and she then freaks out, apologizing for making his clothes wet with her tears. He simply says that the clothes are bound to get wet, as that's why we wear them. She asks him if he would like to go somewhere, somewhere else, like for example her room. As they head into her room, she apologizes to him for not greeting him at the entrance, but Lord Noel simply answers that it is totally fine. He says that it gave him some time to understand her situation, and we see as Irene looks bothered. He asks her if she feels ashamed. He says there is no need to be ashamed. His situation is no different. He tells her that she already knows his grandfather is Archduke William Kirsten, the Great, and he does not hold Noel in high regard. The grandfather's attitude around the house is to spread that same exact attitude to the people living there, and he has to deal with everyone quietly ignoring or mocking him. But things have changed a bit now since he became the heir to the family, but for the most part, it's all still the same. This is all to the fact that he's yet to be recognized as the rightful heir. Irene is concerned and wants to comfort him, but she realizes that she's fully understanding of what he feels like. She gets it. She wonders, however, how he's able to talk about it as if it's nothing, like it doesn't bother him. She asks Lord Noel how he could stand living in a place like that, but all he says and points out is that he just stuck it out and hoped things might get better, and that one day they would accept him but he learned that it was a foolish dream to expect things to get better, and no matter how much you change your surroundings, don't. And he asks if that isn't the reason she wants to use him to run away. She's caught off guard. 
he tells her that he's not trying to say it's bad of her to use him because he plans to use her for the exact same goal and reason. She gets confused and asks him if he means what she thinks he means. He tells her that he now understands what she's going through and he can tell she isn't trying to trick him so he will do his uttermost to get her out of this house. With a happy and sad look on her face, she says his name, but he requests for her to simply just call him Noel and remove the Lord part, since they are now both in the same boat, and asks if they would be alright for him to call her her by name. This makes Irene truly happy, and she smiles and laughs for the first time in a long time. She's feeling true joy. This confuses Noel. She reminds him that he's basically already said her name and called her by her name once where he held her in his arms. He tells her that he will return to visit her soon again, and Irene wishes Lord Noel a safe trip home. We hear the clacking of high heels as we see a maid yelling at Lady Riel that she shouldn't be running like that. She flings open the door and demands to know from Irene what is going on here. We see as Irene just sips on her tea. You go, girl. Woo! She slowly puts down her cup of tea and says the words, be careful, Riel. If you faint now, I'm not going to look after you. The distraught and angry look on Riel's face goes through the whole room and she yells at Irene, demanding her to answer her questions and demands to know why she would be asking Lord Noel to meet her. She starts getting so frustrated that she gets a smile on her face. She tells her that it's fine. She doesn't need to tell Riel that anything. It's totally fine. But without Irene in the house, she would be fine with her dying too, I guess. Irene simply stops her and says, I told you, don't weaponize your illness. But Riel once again just yells at her and says to shut up and just answer her question. But before she can stop yelling, Irene says, we're together. Riel is shocked and asks her what she just said. Irene just repeats to her, Lord Noel and I are together. We're much closer than you think, she tells Riel. All Riel can do is ask her what she is saying and ask her what about Boris, her fiancé? As we see the memory of him kissing Riel with her evil eye staring into the camera, with a determined voice, Irene responds, You can have him. All of the people in the room are shocked and caught by surprise. Irene tells her that Boris, that piece of trash, that affection that she wanted so much from him, Riel, you can have it all, because Irene doesn't care. She's done with her sister. She's done with Boris. She's done with her family. The arguments are getting worse and the air is filled with anger. Riel is shocked by what her sister just said and questions if she's serious. Riel starts to reveal her true self by saying that things will never go Irene's way, thinking she always gets what she wants. Suddenly, their parents storm into the room, furious looking for Irene, wanting to know what's happening. Riel seems to be overwhelmed. She drops to the floor. There's doubt about whether she's pretending again. The servant rushes to help her up. And the father orders the servants to call a doctor. But Riel reassures everyone, she's alright and she just needs some rest. Her face shows a mischievous smile as she requests her parents to be good to her sister, leaving no doubt she'll actually be enjoying all of this drama. Irene's mother is angry and yelling at her, asking why she's been acting so differently and causing problems. She says Irene used to be a good daughter who never gave her parents any trouble. Mother wants to know if Lord Noel is behind all of this. Irene is not planning to give up now. She's unimpressed by her parents' reactions. She glares at them for a second and then speaks up. She tells her mother and father that Lord Noel is not at fault. Irene steps closer to her parents and clarifies that they are the ones to blame and no one else. They forced her into this situation. Her father, consumed by anger, loses control and slaps Irene in the face, calling her an ungrateful brat. Irene is clearly upset. This is abuse. Father insists they care for her and doesn't want to hear her speak like this again. This only confirms Irene's belief that her parents see her as nothing more than a means of assisting Riel. Irene is angry and says she's going to get some rest. She wants everyone to leave. Her father seems like he wants to keep arguing, but their mother stops him. She thinks it's better to calm down and leave Irene for now. They're almost out of the room when her mother warns Irene that she'll regret what happened today. Irene doesn't pay it any mind. Irene touches her cheek. It's really sore. Her father used a lot of force. She's had this happen before and wonders why it feels somewhat different this time. It doesn't hurt as badly as it did in the past. She recalls the moment when she was in Lord Noel's embrace 
and it makes her smile. Somehow, he's already been helping her a lot. One week later, we find Irene in bed, deep in thought. She hasn't heard from the Lord yet, not a single word since, and she's worried that something may have gone wrong. She thinks that maybe Archduke Christen and the possibility that he might even not approve of her. All she wants to do is to help her new friend. There's a knock on the door. A servant comes in to inform Irene that her mother wants to see her immediately. Irene doesn't quite trust it and asks why. The maid answers, she'll understand once she goes downstairs. Mother is just being authoritative at this point, as always. Irene glances at herself in the mirror. She needs to be strong now. There's no need to be scared. Irene has to stay confident, no matter what happens. She made this decision a long time ago, and she's not going to change her mind anymore. Irene exits the room and goes down the stairs. We spot Riel standing beside Boris. He calls for Irene. Riel has a big smirk on her face, enjoying Irene's suffering once more. Irene is surprised that Boris has the courage to show up like this. What's going on here? We also see Mother, who is displeased with her oldest daughter's response. She mentions that this isn't how to greet a guest and instructs Irene to come downstairs. Irene is clearly not in the mood and is about to leave but doesn't get the chance. Suddenly, Boris hugs her. He grabs her. We can see that Irene is uneasy and doesn't want to be hugged by him. Boris quickly asks for her forgiveness and insists that Irene should listen to him. He says it's all just a misunderstanding. Irene has no intention of letting him manipulate her. She kicks him. Disgusted by Boris's words, Boris kneels down and admits he lost his mind for a moment. He says he forgot how important Irene is to him. He calls himself a terrible person and asks for forgiveness. He acknowledges that he was wrong, but also mentions that he was feeling lonely. Irene thinks it must be a joke. She can't believe what she's hearing. Has Boris gone crazy? Boris continues his speech, saying that he has always gave his full affection to her, but it didn't feel like he got anything in return. It's no secret that Boris was ready to take their relationship to the next level, but Irene stops him before he can say it out loud. She doesn't want to hear it. Is this the man she was about to marry? It's just embarrassing now. Irene can't believe she ever had feelings for this guy. All he wanted was to get in her underwear. Riel steps in, wanting to help Boris by stating it's clear he's genuinely sorry. However, Riel's intervention only makes things worse. She suggests that her sister wasn't exactly a saint in this situation. Boris continues, agreeing with Riel, and claims that Irene held a judgmental attitude towards him because of his family's hardships. Boris is attempting to manipulate Irene, making it seem like she's to blame. It's disgusting, and it has to end now. Irene needs to leave this place. No one is on her side, not her mother, sister, or even the maids, who now seem to be judging her as well. Suddenly, a familiar voice calls out, demanding they seize their actions. Just as Lady Irene requested, she looks up and it's Lord Noel. Is he going to save her? While we see Boris is fuming in anger, he asks who this person is, who he thinks he is, and why is he trying to get in between them? Noel tells him that him and Irene are together. This catches Boris by surprise and he's shocked. He asks him, what? Are him and Irene together? As he grabs his collar in an angry gesture, Noel, calm as a cucumber, says that yes, they are together and asks Boris if he perhaps is too dumb to understand that. Perhaps he has difficulties understanding him. Boris once again in anger yells at him and says that this is not what he meant and he says that Irene is with him and not with this man, whoever he is. We then see the mother freaking out about this situation, this anger. She's thinking to herself that she only really called Boris here thinking that he could talk to Irene and not cause this much of a ruckus in a scene. All this drama. All of a sudden, Riel steps forward and softly touches Boris, telling him that it's enough and they shouldn't fight. But Boris pushes her off and calls her an ugh and says for her to let go of him. Riel falls on the ground. Boris notices it and is surprised that she fell as she didn't even get pushed that hard and wonders why Irene isn't apologizing to him. We see the father coming into the room and yelling with pure evil anger in his voice, asking what's going on here? He has a face of disgust and instantly goes to Riel asking if she's hurt and what happened. She says it's all okay, but that Lord Noel, and before she can even say her full sentence, the father says he will handle things and that Riel should go to rest. 
The mother takes Riel away and Riel says that she wants to apologize on behalf of Lord Boris and to please forgive him. Lord Noel says that he isn't the one that should be apologizing. The father steps towards Boris and says he didn't know that Lord Boris was so insolent. He also says to Lord Noel that his family, the Kirstens, are well known and a long history family with dignity, but that he doesn't think Noel has any of those so called good treats. Lord Noel apologizes and says that he didn't come to cause trouble in his home, but that he has yet to hear anything back from the letters he sent to Lady Irene. She's shocked to hear this. Letters? She hasn't received any letters. Lord Noel continues and says that while he is here, there is something he wishes to speak to the father about. He asks Irene to join him and walk down the stairs. Before she can do that, Boris yells that Irene should go back to her room and that he will take care of things here. He thinks to himself that Irene has never disobeyed him before, but she doesn't listen to his words and grabs Lord Noel's hand and apologizes for not having checked more thoroughly for the letters, but he tells her that it's all right, it's not her fault. This catches both the father and Boris off guard, as this is the first time she has disobeyed either of their commands. The butler behind Lord Noel hands him a letter and he grabs it and tells the father the reason he's here today is to let the father know that Lord Boris has incurred a great amount of debt under the Chase family name. This surprises the father. He's shocked. As he reads the letter, he demands to know from Lord Boris what is going on with this. Even Irene notices and freaks out. Since the day she got together with Lord Boris, he's been racking up tons of debt in her name. He'd been using her simply for money this whole time. She wonders if this was the plan all along. The father slams the papers into the face of Boris and demands to know how he could do this. Boris is caught off guard and while looking at the papers, he asks how he did this and says it's all a lie, a forgery. The father doesn't trust a single word from his mouth and yells at him, saying how can he dare to call it forgery when the evidence is right in front of him. He asks Boris if he thinks that the man is a fool and how he dares to sully the great Chase family name. He tells him to leave his home and never return again. Boris is scared and asks for forgiveness, but Boris turns his anger against Noel next and goes in for a strike against him. He says to Noel that if it wasn't for him, then none of this would have happened. But before Boris can even get close to Noel, he's stopped by Lord Noel's loyal butler who grabs him by the neck. Noel tells the butler to simply escort Boris out of the premises. Boris keeps yelling as he's being dragged out. The father with an embarrassed look thanks Noel very cowardly for what he did today and says that his name would have been tarnished if not for Noel's help. Noel says that he simply did what was right. His father, well, the father is still angry and says, fine, and demands he doesn't stay around for too long. Finally, Irene is able to grab a hold of Noel. She's apologizing to him and says that she should have done a better job to make sure she got his letters. But Noel simply says that it's fine. He already knew they wouldn't reach her. He actually just wrote lies in those letters about when he planned on arriving for a visit. Irene asks him what he means. He says that he didn't want anything to get in the way, so he played a little trick on her sister. He specifically wrote fake letters to trick them. We see Irene and Noel walking in the gardens. They are doing this to make sure everyone knows they are together, but she wonders why he's holding her hand. It's not like necessary and she wonders why he's looking at her in such a way. He's holding her firmly. He asks Irene if something happened since he left the last time. She holds her hand on her face where her father had slapped her and says it's nothing. She feels embarrassed. Even though noble girls are nothing more than property sold to form alliances between families, the girls are usually still cared for and raised in loving households, especially since they are from aristocrat bloodlines. But not her. Irene didn't want Noel to see her like this with an injury in her face, but he still found out. Noel, however, tells her lovingly, there's no need for her to hide. She's a victim, and it's the perpetrator who should be ashamed, not the victim. The tears wallow up in her face once more. She's shocked. She tells Noel that she wishes to be of help to him. He says sorry in a confused manner. She says that she feels like she's the only one getting any help at the moment, and she feels like she isn't helping him enough. Noel tells her not to worry about that. He was simply getting rid of an obstacle in the way of their marriage and his new title. He simply just needs more time to get his grandfather's approval 
and that won't be easy to do. But before he can do anything, Irene responds, perhaps then could she meet him? Noel is shocked and asks her what she means. She repeats, she wants to meet his grandfather. She wants to see the Archduke in person. We see Riel searching for her parents. Mother and father are somewhat surprised to see her at this hour. She should be in bed. Riel is up to her tricks once more, planning to manipulate her own family. She tells them she understands they might be concerned and pretends she wants to be with them to provide comfort. The parents quickly fall for it, especially the father, who appears moved by this gesture. He gives his youngest daughter a warm hug. Riel wants to talk to her dad about something. The tears start to flow from her eyes. But of course, they appear insincere, like crocodile tears. Bitch. Father tries to understand why she's sad and asks her what's making her so upset. Seeing his daughter in pain breaks his heart after all. Well, if it's his youngest daughter, that is at least. Riel begins her little act, which she likely prepared in advance. She makes up a story saying that she had already told Irene about how much she admired Lord Noel a long time ago. She claims Irene approached the Lord, even though she knew Riel had feelings for him. She suggests that it was probably Irene who told Boris to seduce her, and briefly Boris's advances were working. Riel goes on with her false story, stating that today was when she finally understood it all. Irene is attempting to snatch Lord Noel from her. Mother and father appeared shocked and surprisingly convinced by the entirely false story. Riel once again successfully manipulated them, and now they genuinely believed that Irene stole the Lord away from her. Father tells Riel not to worry, he will make sure that Irene will not steal the Lord. Even mother doesn't question this strange story. She quickly feels sorry for her youngest daughter and gives her a hug. They say they had no idea Riel was suffering so much. Riel wears a big grin on her face. It seems like she succeeded in fooling her parents with her lies once again. She's determined if she can't have the Lord, then Irene will not have him either. We of course return to Irene. She appears lost in thought. Since Noel's visit, they've been using messengers to exchange letters privately. Two weeks have already gone by and Irene received a message that had a date scheduled on it. It is finally time to meet Noel's grandfather. A carriage arrives and it's Lord Noel. Irene hurries to meet him and apologizes for making him wait. Lord Noel appears delighted to see Irene and doesn't mind the wait at all. Being the gentleman he is, he extends his hand to help her up. Irene expresses her gratitude. This is certainly new for her. This moment reminds her of her first time with Boris, who'd never offered his help with anything. She can't recall the last time she was escorted like this. It makes her feel very happy and appreciated. It's time to head to the palace. Irene is feeling a bit nervous. She asks Lord Noel if his grandfather knows she's be visiting today. Lord Noel's response is somewhat vague. He thinks that his grandfather should be aware, probably. The uncertainty doesn't provide much comfort to Irene. Lord Noel goes on to explain that he didn't inform his grandfather about the visit, but he never received a clear response. Irene doesn't know how to respond. This isn't exactly reassuring. Irene wonders if they'll receive the grandfather's blessings. If not, well, then she'll certainly be stuck with her family forever. After a while, our couple arrives at the palace. It's an incredibly impressive sight, and Irene needs some time to take it all in. She had heard rumors about how grand and beautiful the place is, but she never imagined it would be this big. She's genuinely impressed. Even though her own family is well off, this is on a completely different level. It's nothing compared to the place she's lived in. As they approach the entrance, Irene becomes increasingly nervous. What if the grandfather doesn't like her? What if she makes a mistake now? She was confident before, but now the nerves are getting to her. Lord Noel senses Irene's anxiety and tries to reassure her. He tells her that everything will be fine. Irene was already in a difficult situation before, and it can't possibly get worse. He continues, telling Irene not to blame herself for what's to come, and not to punish herself too much. These words make Irene really happy, as she's not used to people being so kind. She looks happy. Lord Noel really has managed to calm her down. She's now ready to meet Noel's grandfather. The servants welcome our couple into the house. Lord Noel asks if his grandfather is in his room. Servant Tom confirms that he is, but warns them that he is... It's... Well, he's, he's quiet up there. Quiet as ever, and he's always been. Irene wears a determined expression, and Lord Noel notices. He finds it cute, as if she's ready for a battle. 
He reassures Irene, telling her not to worry because, no matter what happens, his grandfather won't try to eat her. The servants can't believe his ears. Was that Lord Noel making a joke? It seems almost impossible, as he's never actually seen him do this before. Irene also notices the unusual behavior. This isn't how Lord Noel typically acts. However, she's charmed by it. The Lord didn't think it was that big of a deal, and he's a bit shy as his cheek turned red. This is certainly something new. Servant Tom is still a bit perplexed. Who would believe their relationship is strictly business? The Lord orders Tom to make sure no one comes near them. He doesn't want to be disturbed. Tom confirms that he understands the request. He definitely prefers a Lord who cracks jokes over the one he usually works with. The butler is aware that it's a crucial moment and to keep the two particular individuals away from everyone else. And we catch a glimpse of them. Lord Noel knocks on the door and the couple enter the room. We catch a glimpse of the grandfather sitting in his chair, facing the window. He remains silent. Lord Noel introduces Irene, who is polite and happy to finally meet the Duke. She stammers a bit, but it's actually cute. The Duke doesn't respond or even turn around, which irritates Noel because he knows Irene is doing her best. Irene notices Noel's frustration and asks him to leave. As she's confident, she knows what to do. Noel isn't sure if he should leave her alone, but Irene assures him it's okay. She can handle herself. Irene approaches the Duke, well aware that she needs to choose her words carefully. The Duke still hasn't turned around, which probably indicates he doesn't want to, to even look at her or talk to her. Irene, however, isn't giving up. She's determined to wait until he finally turns around. It's only a matter of time. The old clock in the room is ticking away, and time is passing quickly. Lord Noel knocks on the door, reminding Irene that it's getting late and she should return. Irene is surprised by how late it has become, and she tells the Duke she will be back tomorrow, bidding him farewell. The door closes and we finally see more of the grandfather, who has a grumpy expression on his face. Noel and Irene return to the carriage. The Lord wants to know what happened in the room. Did Irene just stand there the entire time? He mentions that it was a risky move. However, Irene explains that you can't force the Duke into a conversation, as it might only make him dislike her even more. Her intention was simple, to show the Duke that she'd be there, waiting, until he chose to turn around. She's uncertain if it worked, but she's not just going to give up. Irene asks if it's possible to return tomorrow because she wants to see the Duke again and give it another try. Lord Noel is pleased that she's not giving up and thanks her for the patience. Two weeks have passed, and during this time, Irene has visited the Duke every single day. Our girl has a lot of patience, I'm gonna be real. She's been standing there and waiting, but he never turned around, even once in those two weeks. Irene wonders if today will be any different. She knew from the start that this would be a challenging task. Who would accept a girl like her after all? Noel knocks on the door as if it's getting late again. He opens the door and finds Irene standing there, looking a bit sad. This sight angers Noel because he knows how hard Irene has been trying lately, yet the Duke doesn't seem to care. He, how, how can he let her stand there without even turning around once? Noel tells Irene that it's no use and they should be heading back. Irene remains polite and bids farewell to the grandfather, insisting on returning tomorrow. The Duke finally speaks up telling her not to come back. Hearing this, it infuriates Noel. He knows the Duke is just punishing him, and for what? Simply because his mother was a commoner? It doesn't give the Duke the right to treat Irene this way. She doesn't deserve it. Lord Noel is struggling containing his anger, and Irene notices, taking his hand. Lord Noel tells Irene that he respects her very much, and he's unsure if they should continue, fully aware of how difficult it is for her. It's written all over her face. Irene pleads for one more chance, wanting to try again. All she wants is one more day. Lord Noel decides to agree, but tomorrow will be the final attempt. If they don't make any progress, then they'll have to come up with another plan. Irene feels both sad and exhausted. She had thought everything would work out, but with each passing day, she becomes more tired. Irene is about to enter her room, but she doesn't know yet what she's going to find there. She can't believe her eyes. Her father is in her room and he has destroyed all of her artwork. It's all on the floor, in pieces. Father is furious and he steps on the fragments of her paintings. He's already found it suspicious that she was spending so much time in that room and now he knows why. Father knows she's back to painting even though he had forbidden her from doing so. Irene tries to pick up the shattered pieces of her paintings, realizing 
that all her hard work was for nothing. Father's also upset that she's been spending time with Lord Noel and still believes Irene stole Noel from Riel. He reminds Irene that he had forbidden her to paint, but she's not listening. He warns her and makes it very clear she's not allowed to paint or see Lord Noel anymore or there will be consequences. This is the moment. This is the moment when Irene breaks down. She's crying, seeing her art shattered. Those paintings meant everything to her, and now they're destroyed. How could her father be so cruel? Is she even allowed to be happy? It's the following day, and Irene had a really rough night. However, she still decides to meet up with Lord Noel. Our Lady is a little bit later than usual, and she apologizes. Lord Noel instantly notices that something is wrong. Irene looks different, her face seems troubled, and she appears exhausted. However, she chooses not to tell Lord Noel what happened the previous night. She reassures him that she's okay and ready to return to the palace. When they arrive at the palace, even servant Tom notices that Irene doesn't look well. She appears very pale. Once again, Irene lies, telling him not to worry and assuring him that she's totally okay. Lord Noel shakes his head, knowing something is wrong, but he doesn't want to push Irene to talk. Irene enters the Duke's chamber with the resolve to make one last effort. Her usual polite greeting falls on deaf ears to the Duke as he remains resolute and turns away from her. Irene apologizes for being late and explains that something happened. She adds that today might be the last day of her visits. She candidly shares her thoughts with the Duke, her voice trembling with vulnerability. She believed that if she kept waiting, eventually the Duke would turn around. But he remained silent. Irene continues, saying she had grown accustomed to being ignored by people. Her hope had been that patience would be enough, that if she just remained herself, eventually the Duke would acknowledge her. But that dream had crumbled. Irene's still human. She has her limits too. Yet she doesn't want to give up. Irene doesn't believe that the Duke truly despises Lord Noel. Because if that really was the case... She wouldn't even be standing here. The Duke would have kicked him out a long time ago. She explains that she can't really know what he's thinking, but whatever his reason may be, she wants the Duke to know that the person on the receiving end usually ends up hurt and very lonely. After more than two weeks of persistence, the Duke finally makes a move. He rises from his chair, turns around, and speaks to Irene. He tells her not to cry. We delve into Noel's past witnessing a younger version of him clinging to his father. They're paying a visit to the Duke. The Duke is angry and accuses his son of being out of his mind. This is the first time young Noel is being introduced to his grandfather. Noel's father steps forward to take responsibility, but the Duke scorns him as a pathetic fool. Meanwhile, we spot another child who bears a striking resemblance to Noel. This child clings to the Duke. Bewildered by the situation, the Duke, despite his anger, is protective of this precious grandson. Noel's father persists, revealing that Noel's mother has passed away, leaving him with no place to go. He emphasizes that the blood of the family still flows through Noel's veins, and he wants to be part of his son's life. Noel, even as a young child, is perceptive and understands the situation. His grandfather makes it clear he doesn't accept Noel as his grandson. He emphasizes that his son can decide whether Noel stays or not because he is the head of the household. However, he firmly states that he will never accept Noel as his grandchild. He turns away and orders them to leave. Noel looks upset. His heart is broken. Noel's half-brother asks the Duke if the little boy they just saw is his brother. The Duke denies it, claiming that he's the only grandson he has. The little boy is not aware that his grandfather is lying. He's just happy to be with his grandfather after all. We learn more about the Duke's thoughts. He explains that he never acknowledged Noel. His other grandson was fearful of losing his grandfather's affection. Things got even worse when his son died from illness. After that, the Duke became even more attached to his oldest son grandson, driving a further wedge between Noel and him. Then, one day, the oldest grandson was in an accident. He fell on his neck and died instantly. There was nothing they could do for him. The accident had a profound impact on the Duke. He struggled to come to terms with the loss of his grandson. Noel attempted to console him, but his efforts were in vain. The Duke's feelings towards Noel remained unchanged. This left Noel feeling broken once again. The Duke continues, instead of trying to bridge the gap between them, he did what he thought was best for Noel. He made sure they couldn't hurt him. We're not sure yet who the Duke is talking about, 
where we catch a glimpse of the people involved. A sort of group of people, a family member of sorts. He says that in order to make sure that they didn't go after him well, the Duke had set conditions that they must marry a woman, he must marry a woman, that he approves of to inherit the title of Archduke, to make sure those other family members don't go after him. However, the Duke never expected him to bring someone so soon. Originally, he thought Irene only came because she was interested in the title. He thought she would give up after a few days. But that was obviously not the case. She kept coming every day. And as time passed, he came to realization that it was never about the title. But even then, he just couldn't give Irene his approval. Then one day, Irene was later than usual. The Duke thought she'd finally given up. Was that all she could handle after all? No, he was wrong. Irene still showed up. And when Irene told him it would be the last time visiting, it moved the Duke. When Irene began to share her story, recounting the times when people had ignored her, it stirred a sense of sadness within him. It within him. He couldn't help but feel that it was incredibly unfair, the fact that her absence left him feeling disappointed and sad. He confirmed it. It meant that he had already accepted her. Duke doesn't want to make the same mistake twice, and he doesn't want to live with regrets anymore. And that's the reason why he finally decided to get up. He actually likes Irene. We see him approaching her, telling her not to cry. Irene thinks she's dreaming. Is this actually happening? Noel enters the room and is very surprised to see what's going on. Grandfather is talking to her? Noel excuses himself and informs the Duke that he and Irene need to leave. Irene's perplexed, wondering if something's had gone wrong. They rush to get out of the palace and they run into servant Tom. Noel asks him about someone's whereabouts. At this point, we aren't certain whom Noel is referring to. Tom says he's only able to confirm that he entered the grounds, but they lost track of him after that. Irene wants to know what's going on. Who are they talking about? Noel apologizes. He wants to explain but gets interrupted. Long time no see, cousin. We finally get to know who our mystery guest is. A man appears in front of Irene and Noel. He bears a striking resemblance to Noel. Clearly a family member. Noel's cousin says he was just on his way to see grandfather. Irene snags his eye. She doesn't really know what to think. The situation is making her a bit uncomfortable. Noel squeezes her hand. It's time for them to go. It's clear that Noel wants to get out of there as fast as he can. The mystery man expresses disappointment, wishing he had more time to catch up with his cousin since it's been a while. However, he reassures him that there will be always another opportunity and bids farewell. He calls Lady Irene by her name. She's a bit surprised. She never introduced herself. And how does he know her name? Noel is rushing to get outside. He instantly apologizes to his lady. She says it's okay, but she why why would that know why would that man know who she is? The Lord hesitates for a moment, but then decides to tell her the truth. He clarifies that the individual they cross path with is his cousin, Lord Ascardo Lixis. He is also an heir. Noel refrained from telling Irene earlier because he didn't want her to witness the difficult situation he's facing. He explains that if they do get married, his cousin will come after Irene, and even his supporters will help him. Her life could be in danger. Lord Noel would understand if Irene decides to break off the deal. He apologizes for not telling her sooner. He's clearly ashamed. Irene calls Noel's name, showing her determination not to abandon him. She confesses her surprise, as she initially believed things would improve once the Duke opened up to her, though the situation wasn't what she expected. However, her dedication is unwavering. She's still on Noelle's side, and the Lord is still helping her too after all. She tells Noelle not to worry. With visible emotions, Noelle thanks Lady Irene, and she responds by thanking him as well. As the wheels of the cart clunk, we see as Irene is worried. Noelle can sense Irene is concerned, and he tells her that she doesn't have to visit her grandfather any further. Irene thinks to herself that he's right. It did seem that the Archduke is willing to start opening up to her, but she does wish that they had a little bit more time to prepare. She clenches her dress. He tells Irene that from now on, he will try to talk to him instead. Irene says that there seemingly is no more for her to do going forward then. But before that, he and her are talking and they still need to take one more very important step. She still needs to cut all the ties with the Chase family, her own family. He says that she must give up all the rights, the Chase family name and inheritance. We see Irene's home and she's thinking about the fact that when she gets married, she'll be leaving the home to live with the Archduke's manor, and she will still be part of the Chase family, 
and that's most likely going to cause trouble later with regards to inheritances. However, there's one way to resolve these issues, and that is to give up all the rights to the Chase family name and legacy. From the inheritance she would be receiving from her parents' death or any support she would get from the crown, she would need to let go of all of it. She would lose all the rights to the Chase family name. All of it. We see a tiny bit of doubt in Irene's face, but she knows that this is the only way to completely free herself from that house. Noelle tells her that if they succeed in getting him his inheritance, they will need to figure out if they would stay married or if they would file for a divorce right away. And that even if they do end up parting ways, that he promises to secure a comfortable life for Irene. As a horse carriage comes to a stop, they both get out, and Irene tells him that she will be sure to make her decision soon. Noel tells her that he would prefer the answer sooner rather than later, and that otherwise things might get complicated, especially with his cousin. She tells Noel to have a safe trip home before she heads inside. We see that her face is gloomy, and we can also see that Noel is stressed and worried about that. We see that Irene is thinking to herself that she's a little hesitant, as she does know they treated her poorly, but she still had fond memories with them. But she also knows that she can't take it anymore. As she enters the door, the light is too bright. Inside, we see her parents welcoming her home. We see that Irene remembers the moment her father had attacked her about Lord Noel and her paintings. It, chills, it just sends chills down her spine, and she prepares herself to be hit again. But then her mother grabs her for a hug and tells her it's all right. She says that she understands that Irene must have been so upset given that they didn't understand her. This catches Irene off guard. She doesn't understand why her mother is saying this sort of stuff all of a sudden. We see the silhouette of Riel in the corner as we hear their mother say to Irene that she must have been so angry and felt lonely the whole time that Riel told them everything, that she had been feeling lonely while they were taking care of Riel, and that that's the reason she decided to go after a man like Noel Kirsten. Instantly, Irene realizes what's going on, and she realizes, not again. She won't take it anymore. All this bullshit. Do they think she would be grateful for this? She presses her mother's hands away, Irene says she is tired and wants to rest. A loud voice screams, Ungrateful brat! It's the father. He says, Where do you think you're going when your mother is speaking to you? Irene tells him to step aside, and it angers him even further. He demands to know what she just said to him. He prepares to fling a hand in her face again, but before he can do it, she is stopped by the mother, who says that this is the reason she has changed the father says that the mother is the one that should stop, as it's because of her she's holding back, that he's holding back and not even hitting her anymore. But the mother says that there must be a misunderstanding and that Irene would never steal Riel's man. She says all this bad stuff is because of that man, Lord Noel Kirsten. We hear Irene yell out to stop it. Chills are sent down everyone in the room. She says she doesn't know what the hell they're talking about, when calling Noel Riel's man, and that Noel isn't a bad man, that he has been just helping her out. Her mother says that if they could understand, she was doing this to make a connection to the Archduke, and then says that the real heir is Lord Ascardo, but before she can stop her, Irene says that she's going to marry Noel. She says she's not marrying him for the title or for access to the Archduke. We see as Riel is biting her nails in pure evil anger. God, I hate this bitch so bad. Oh my lord, please just do something about her. Either way, Irene continues and says that Noelle and her are simply just wanting to be together and that this is truly the end for her and her family. Her father stomps forward and is about to attack her, asking what kind of nonsense she is spouting. As he does this, Irene falls back in fear and hits the door. As it flings open, she's caught in the hands of Lord Noel of all people. He says he was worried about her, so he came up to the house. He felt that the house is usually so bright, but when Irene came home, it was so dark and looked like no one was living in here. The house almost felt like the darkness of the home was swallowing her up, and he felt that today he would make sure that Irene was all right. He wants to marry her and wonders if it was okay for him to enter. He once again asks her if she's okay, and she says she is, but... Before she can answer, the father is yelling, demanding to know what Noel is doing in his house, saying that Noel ruined both his daughters. Irene thinks to herself, what is he talking about both? She remembers that he mentioned that she stole Riel's man. She can tell that someone, aka Riel, has been meddling again. 
The father asks if she knows how much Riel, but before he continues, Riel runs in again and does the fake bullshit where she says that she apologizes to Lord Noel and to Irene as well, that it was all her fault. She says it's all her fault and that she has been in love with Lord Noel for a long time. This makes Irene furious. It's lies again, always lies with this girl. Riel says that she told her parents and that they assumed that Irene had approached him to get in Riel's way. Before Riel can continue her bullshit, Noel steps in and says, You're wrong. He says that he was the one who approached Lady Irene first, and not the other way around. Riel freaks out and demands to know, What? Why would you do that? He says that he caught his eye, well, she caught his eye, the moment he saw her, and that he approached her and struck up a conversation right away. The father busts in again and says, How dare he speak to his sick child like that? Imagine if she would collapse from all the stress. Noel says to him that he hasn't changed one bit, and he only has his eyes for his sickly daughter while he's left Irene and constantly calls her pain over and over again. The father gets angry and yells at Irene to speak up and asks if he's, what he says is true. He yells and says that how can she suffer when she has her health and everything she could ever want in life? Irene calls out Noel's name and asks, says that the subject they spoke about earlier, she's made up her decision. She made the decision. It's time to cut the ties with this family. She says, I'm going to marry Lord Noel. That is what Irene says to her parents. And that she doesn't care if the two of them are opposed to the marriage. She says that she will no longer be Riel's sister and she will no longer be their daughter. We once again hear the words that Irene spoke echo through the house. Her father is furious, but he says, so be it. But that she would know that one day what she has done, she will come to regret and that she will know how much she hurt all the people with her selfish actions. He turns away and her mother says that she is disappointed in her as she walks away. Only Riel remains in front of them now. She asks her where her sense of duty is and how she could betray their parents like that after they fed her and clothed her for so long. She calls Irene a monster and says that if it wasn't for this family, she would already be dead. Before she can finish, Irene steps in and says that this family already abandoned her first. Riel is furious and says that she and her and Noelle will live to regret this, but Noelle just acts nonchalant and says he has no idea what she's talking about. Riel says that her sister Irene is not a kind and quiet girl, but Noelle just replies that he doesn't want Irene because she's quiet and kind. He wants her because he likes her. Riel is fuming and angry, and God, I love this bitch being angry, so fun, and says that if he wants to become Archduke, that he should have just chosen her instead. The fucking audacity. Noelle says, how could I marry a liar? Noelle turns to Irene and asks if she has nowhere else to go tonight that she can return to the manor with him. But Riel steps in and aggressively grabs Irene's hand and says in an evil tone, don't go. She says that if she leaves now, that will be the end. And if she seriously is going to cut ties with her mother and father, the two people who raised her, Irene replies that it's exactly the reason why she is leaving, because if she stays in this home, she will never be able to cut her ties to them. Riel freaks out and yells, So you're really willing to betray them? While she yells, the grip of Irene's hand is even harder. She keeps yelling and saying that after all they've done for Irene, she's about to leave. But Noel steps in and removes her hand from Irene and says that out of respect for Irene, he will be stepping in this time. He says that, Raising Irene was not done out of kindness by her parents, but out of duty and responsibility. Riel yells at him to stay out of it, but he says that he cannot stand by and listen to Riel speak of Irene in such a way. Riel loses it and decides to leave the room. As she's leaving, she says in a tone of a bitch that hasn't been piped in a while that, Ha! I see you two are perfect for each other! As she slams the door behind herself. Irene is stressed out and Noel can tell and tells her not to worry about that, that her life is her own, and no one else's right to dictate how she lives. This livens up Irene, and her smile returns. She thanks him for his kind words, and he asks if there's anything he needs to collect from her room upstairs. She thinks about the only thing she wants being her paintings that her father had ripped up, but she just tells Noelle that there is nothing she wants, and that she's fine. Noelle says it's okay, and they can return for her stuff later. 
We see the horse carriage moving through the night as Irene wakes up from her slumber, wondering if she'd fallen asleep to begin with and how. She is worried about possibly having drooled, but Noel tells her that she should have just kept on sleeping. She asks him how long she was asleep for, and he says long enough that he was also able to catch a quick nap. She apologizes to him, but he says it's fine, he's just joking. She's then caught off guard by Noel laughing and smiling. She looks at him with a bewildered face. She finds it weird and not easy to figure out when he's being serious and when he's joking. They reach the manor and decide to head inside, as it's been a rough day for both of them. We see Tom the butler being surprised that both of them returned in the carriage and wonders if they went for a ride. But Noel wonders why he's looking at him in such an odd way and says that a lot of stuff has happened and that they should speak inside. After explaining everything to Tom, he understands everything and asks Irene to follow him as he will take her to her room. And if she is hungry, he will also get her food. She says she's not hungry and tells him that she's thankful to Mr. Secretary for taking care of her. But Tom, Tom basically just interrupts her and says, it's fine, she can just call him Tom. He also mentions to Noel that the Archduke wants him. Noel says it's fine, he will go and talk to him. He asks Tom to take care of Irene in the meantime, and he also wonders to himself why Noel is being so polite, as usually he has an angry demeanor. We see as Tom is showing Irene the guest room and tells her that they will prepare a proper room for her before the noon tomorrow. She apologizes for the fuss, but Tom says it's fine and not a problem at all for the future Archduchess. This makes Irene blush. Archduchess? She can't imagine that. Tom says he will send up a maid with more comfortable attire for her, and if she needs anything, to just ring the bell. Irene thanks Tom, and he leaves the room. Irene is tired as she lays down in the bed. She realizes that things have turned out so well, and that if she hadn't gone to that party, and that if she hadn't, you know, held on to Noel, nothing would have changed for her in her life. In the morning, Noel is telling Irene there is nothing to worry about, but she seems stressed. It reminds him of the first time she was there. During the night, Noel had explained the whole situation to the Archduke and asked him to see them the first thing in the morning, but Irene has not been able to relax since she heard this. They head inside. We see the Archduke standing by his desk. He says, welcome, dear child. Wilfred, Irene, and Noel look worried. They're confused. The Archduke coughs in an awkward way and it surprises both of them. She says good morning to him, but the Archduke says that Noel has told him everything. He says that he is sorry she had to go through all of that. She says thank you. He tells her that she doesn't have to worry about a thing and just focus on settling in and then he turns over to Noel. Noel is nervous. What does grandfather have to say? There's a few seconds of silence before Noel responds. The Duke changes his mind. He was about to say something but decides to let it drop. It's nothing, you may leave, he says. Noel feels like their relationship is changing. Irene's happy too. The Archduke finally spoke to Noel. Might have been a super short conversation, but it's a start. Looks like Grandfather has more to say, but he stays quiet. Irene thanks him, but he says it's okay. There's no need to thank him for anything. Irene thinks it's a natural thing to do. She's very grateful that he allowed her to stay in the palace after all. But she was mainly thanking the Duke for talking to Noel. He's finally opening up to them. And for once, he was actually kind to his grandson. Irene and Noel leave the room. Irene knows that the Duke understand or understood what she was really trying to say. She can feel it. Noel has also noticed that the grandfather was more kind than usual. It appears he likes Irene more than he thought he would. Lady Irene is very happy hearing those words. It's rather a relief to her though. She explains that she was really nervous. Oh, there you are. It's Butler Tom. He was already looking for the couple. Lady Irene's room on the second floor is ready. He first gives her instructions on how to get to the room. She needs to go down the hallway on the left, but then he changes his mind. Tom wants to escort Lady Irene there. The palace is pretty big, and he doesn't want her to get confused or lost even. Lord Noel seems a bit irritated by hearing that. He insists on showing her how to get there. Tom is a bit surprised to hear that, because it's always him showing guests where to go. He proposes to join them, but no. Lord Noel insists it should be him and Irene. Initially, Tom is puzzled, but he quickly catches on to the situation. Oh, wink, wink. Even breaking into a brief chuckle. The Lord explains that he still wants to discuss something with Lady Irene in private. But why is he blushing? The couple arrive at the room. Irene wants to know what the Lord wanted to talk about. He explains that they have some formality to take care of. 
They should decide on the rules of their relationship and, very important, draft a contract. All right. Irene didn't even think about that yet, but she understands that drafting a contract is a normal thing to do. Lord Noel continues. First, they need to establish a goal for the contract. He wants to become Archduke, and Lady Irene wishes to cut ties with her family. He pens everything down. However, the relationship can't just be ended right after meeting those goals. It would put them in a very difficult situation if people found out they got married just to claim a title. He tells Irene they have to stay in a relationship for at least two years. That means they'll have to stay together even if she ends up hating the Lord. He asks Irene if she's okay with it. She instantly agrees with all of it. Noel says she doesn't need to answer right away. She can still think about it. This is really serious business after all. Irene is really straightforward. There's no way she'll end up hating Lord Noel. She knows he's a good person and she trusts him. Don't you think we'll be quite close by then, she says. Lord Noel knows exactly how she feels because he feels the same way. Then there's one last important thing to discuss. If they part ways after fulfilling two years of married life, he promises her that he will send her 500 gold a month for the next 90 years. Irene is really surprised to hear about this. It was never her intention to make this about money. Lord Noel explains that on top of that, he will also provide financial support for all necessities, including housing. Irene thinks that's way too much money, but Lord Noel explains that in the end, she's the one helping her, him, to inherit an important title, the title of Archduke, which is a big deal. And that's just priceless and worth far more than anything he could ever give her. He thinks of this as a very much the least he can do for her, but still, it's making Irene a bit uncomfortable. Lord Noel is serious about this though. He's not going to change his mind. It's part of the deal. Irene just decides to accept it. Lord Noel asks if there's anything else she would like to add to the contract. She blushes. There's clearly something she wants to talk about, but she's a bit shy. It's regarding marital relations. She explains naturally they'll be in a marital relationship as soon as they get married. Oh, Lord Noel is finally starting to understand what Irene is referring to. Wink, wink. He hadn't thought about that yet. He suggests to talk about that later. They both blush. The Lord asks if there is something else they should add. But no, Irene says it's all good. They decide to keep the contract locked away in a secret safe, tucked into a corner of Noel's study. And they both agreed to take it out on the day that the contract would end. There's five levels of magic locking that safe. It would be basically impossible for anyone to open it. Noel thinks Irene should choose the password. She takes a moment to think... The night of the ball, the date, that would be good. It was the first day they met after all. He agrees and makes sure everything is set. Irene wonders if they should take care of other stuff. And yes, there's more to think of. The wedding announcement. Noel says that next month, there'll be a party to commemorate the family's 700 year history. The perfect opportunity to announce the marriage. Lady Irene looks surprised. She realizes that this is a really big event. Members of the royal family and the heads of several newspapers will be there. But then there's also the grandfather and more extended family. Irene is a bit concerned because even though grandfather has been friendly, they still haven't gotten his approval yet. And once they announce the marriage, there'll be no turning back. Lord Noel has a big smirk on his face. Oh, Irene gets it now. If they announce the marriage in front of all those people, the news will spread throughout the entire country by the next morning. If that happens, then no one will be able to stop the marriage. Not even Grandfather would be able to do anything. Irene nods. She's aware it's all very risky, but also effective. Those who are against Noel becoming the Archduke are probably extended relatives. Seeing how Noel is still alive must mean it's impossible for them to harm Noel. But that might also mean that from now on, they're going to make Irene the next target. On the other hand, and we will be introduced to everyone at such a big event. It will make it very difficult for any of them to do anything there, but she reminds, she basically just gets reminded of the day Noel warned her of all of it. This might get actually dangerous. Noel sees that Irene is lost in thought. He tells her to stay close to him at all times. She tells him that she won't stray from him. Right now, Irene doesn't feel very afraid, and that's all thanks to Lord Noel. He's a very dependable person. It's time to call it a day, but Irene wants to ask for a last request. She would like to have some paper, pens, and paint. She wants to paint Lord Noel already thought of that. She can find paper and pens in her desk drawer, and he'll make sure she gets to paint tomorrow. Irene is very thankful. Lord Noel tells her to just tell him if she needs anything else. This is her home now, after all. 
He tells her to rest well and leaves the room. Irene quickly searches for her paper and pens because she wants to start drawing. It's been a while since he last did it. She realizes he doesn't have to do it in secret anymore. She can even draw with the windows wide open. She begins with a sketch. It looks promising. She's getting a lot of inspiration of the garden outside. But when Irene looks a bit more carefully, she notices Lord Noel outside. What is he doing out there so late? Whom is Lord Noel talking to? Intrigued, Irene approaches the window to gain a clearer view. Something seems amiss. The individual in question has blue hair. Hold on, is that Escardo Lexus? The atmosphere seems tense. What's going on? Irene is obviously too far away to hear what they're saying. While trying to get a better view, Irene accidentally knocks over a book and her drawing making a loud noise. She panics, worried she might have been caught. Escado hears the noise and turns to check. Irene feels really embarrassed for dropping her notebook and papers. It's done and it can't be fixed. Now, trying to sneak away quietly, Irene tries to hide. She can't resist peeking again and sees that Lord Noel and Escado are gone. When did they leave so quickly? Irene feels embarrassed but still wants to know what happened between them. Uh-oh. Irene realizes she dropped her book somewhere, but it's too dark to spot it. She really needs it and wants to grab it before anyone notices. But before she can even leave the room, Lord Noel is already there. He was just about to knock. What are the odds? Irene's heart is pounding. She didn't see that coming. Turns out, Lord Noel found her book, and he says, I think you dropped these. He hands them to Irene, and she's still a bit surprised. He noticed this so quickly? Feeling like she has to explain, Irene tells Noel she saw him earlier with his cousin and dropped the book by accident. Noel calmly says he already knows. Turns out he and Escarda were aware she was watching them the whole time. Irene is super embarrassed, but surprisingly, Lord Noel finds it kind of funny and cute. He can totally see what she's thinking. She's like an open book. And you know what? That's one of the things Noel likes about her. Noel replies the recent not-so-funny chat he had with Escardo. We meet again like this. What a coincidence. Isn't the sky beautiful today? It's Escardo, and it seems like he's up to no good. Noel knows they're in front of Irene's window. It's definitely not the time to be loud. Escardo knows what he's doing. It's clear that he wanted to meet her. How sly. His cousin tells him he heard that Lady Irene is residing in the mansion. Seems like the news spread fast. Escardo isn't hiding his true colors and mocks his cousin, saying, I wonder how long will this woman last? With that dirty blood of yours, do you really think that this woman will love you for who you are? She won't remain forever by your side, so snap out of it. Noel gets mad. Escardo's at it again, making fun of his mom. All he wants is to bring Noel down and mess with his confidence. How rude. Love is never something the Lord desired in the first place. Noel explains, Ever since his grandfather refused to acknowledge him, he never expected anybody's affection. It's not something he needs, because he's simply used to living without the same thing that Irene is missing, which is love. She's definitely a good person, but Noel knows he could never ask for more. It's simply not an option. Noel feels like something's going on. His cousin is most likely plotting something to take Irene away from him. Noel starts feeling unsure and kind of scared. What if Irene decides to change her mind and leaves? That thought makes him uneasy. Noel, are you okay? Irene asks. She sees Noel's lost in thoughts and just wants to check if he's okay. The Lord wants to talk about what's on his mind and decides to be 100% honest about his feelings. He makes sure Irene knows that even she, if she was to leave him for someone else, he's not planning on just letting her go. He won't be able to do it. Did Noel just confess his feelings to Irene? Irene didn't expect to hear any of this. Did something happen between him and Escardo in the garden earlier? Noel looks anxious. Irene wants to make sure that her fiancé knows he's not on his own. That will never happen. I need you, she says. That's really cute. She also ensures him he shouldn't worry. Irene doesn't want anyone else. It can only be Lord Noel. Irene couldn't have said it better. Noel is happy and apologizes. He realizes that he shouldn't have been so stressed. He knows he can rely on his lady. Irene also looks relieved. She's not aware of what happened in the garden, but she's glad that Noel looks more at ease now. Could it be? Do I seem like an unreliable person? Irene says. 
Noel says it's a misunderstanding. He seems to panic a bit. But it looks like that was unnecessary. Irene was just joking. It's the next day, and it seems sunny outside. Lord Noel is in his office, looking tired because he couldn't sleep. He can't stop thinking about the chat that he had with Lady Irene yesterday. Her words, especially when she said it should be only him and no one else. They keep echoing in his head. He made a promise to protect her, but now it seems like he's the one leaning on her instead. Tom walks in and right away sees that Noel looks tired. He asked him if he stayed up all night. Looks like everyone can tell, huh? Tom reminds him that there is only one month left until the wedding ceremony, so it's crucial for the master to take care of his health. Are you nagging me now? Lord Noel says. Tom would never do that. He's just trying to help. If Noel decides to drop the marriage bomb at the 700th anniversary in a month, it's Tom's job to make sure everything for the ceremony is ready in time. Noel says sorry, thinking he might have been a bit rude, but Tom doesn't seem too impressed with the apology. He explains that Noel has always been like that. Unlike other fancy nobles who care a lot about pride and authority, Noel is different. He always admits when he messes up and says sorry for it. It's the reason why he's so loyal to the master. Tom feels a bit embarrassed. He says that the Lord shouldn't apologize because he's nothing but his loyal servant who's always at his disposal. However, Noel doesn't see Tom as a mere servant, though. He explains he was able to survive in his lonely place thanks to him. Tom doesn't know what to say. He's a bit embarrassed, but also touched by the words. That was a nice thing to say of Noel. Noel is sorting through some papers when he sees a purple envelope. What's this? Tom seems excited and tells his master, it's an invitation, one from Duchess Jasmine. Irene is getting up too. She feels good. It's been a while since she had a good sleep. She remembers the old days when she lived with her parents and sister. Back then, she had to keep an eye on Riel all the time. It was hard to get a decent night's sleep. But things have changed now. Thanks to Lord Noel, Irene wonders if Noel also had a good night's sleep. All of a sudden, one of the maids walks in and is surprised to see Lady is already up. Irene asks the maid if she came to wake her up. Turns out, no. The Viscount asked her to leave warm water by Irene's bed for washing her face. The Viscount? The maid clarifies she means Tom. Wait, so Tom is a Viscount? Irene heard a bit about the famous Esquan family already, but damn. The previous generation's achievements were so great that it spread to the capital and became an important topic of discussion. To this day, there is still an important noble household. Irene always kind of knew there was more to Tom. He's not just a regular servant. Turns out, he's from a fancy family. So, Noelle is pretty lucky to have him as a secretary, huh? The maid says she'll let Lord Noel know Irene is up, but Irene stops her. She wants to go see him herself. The maid explains Noel is in his office. She's happy to show Irene the way. The two ladies are heading to the office when something grabs Irene's eyes. See, she sees four unfamiliar guys in the palace. Why are they here? And they're all staring at a painting too. The maid explains that there's an art exhibition of new paintings painted by famous artists that will be hosted. The four men are the most likely discussing an issue. Irene wants to see the painting. The four guys don't agree on something. They're all really focused on studying the paintings. No, isn't the order I said the correct one, one of them says. The guy next to him responds, Are your eyes working? The season's order is spring, summer, autumn, and winter. The guy keeps discussing. And Irene is listening closely. She knows the answer. It's winter. The men turn around, surprised that someone was behind them all along. Irene apologizes for the sudden intrusion. It looks like the men were discussing the season's order in this piece. Irene suggests that she takes a close look. Maybe she can help. The men step aside, letting her check out the painting. The maid is a bit concerned. Does Lady Irene know what she's doing? It's difficult to analyze the painting based on common knowledge itself. The painting was drawn by an anonymous artist who's yet to debut and reveal themselves. Fortunately, it caught Grand Duke Kirsten's eyes and will be displayed in the mansion. The maid assumes that whatever Lady Irene will say will be fine. The men will probably just nod. Irene's certain of her answer, though. The order in the painting is spring, summer, autumn, and winter from the outside in. One of the men is not so certain about it. Then why are the flowers blooming in the winter? He explains it's a landscaping painting. And he's never seen flowers bloom in the winter. Irene says the painting is drawn by an unknown artist named Carr at first glance. 
may look like a landscape painting, but actually, this painting was based on the memory of the artist's past lover. Despite the changing seasons, the flowers still bloom, just like the artist's wish for the place he and his lover stayed to never change. Everyone is impressed with Irene. She's great at explaining, and you can tell it's her true passion. Even the maid is captivated listening to her. Irene continues and says that some people say that his view is fictional, but in the end, it's only the artist that knows its true meaning. Looking at the painting makes Irene happy. It's been a while since she last saw Carr's work. She knows this artist's work very well. She first saw the painting in the old mansion where she used to live. Irene blushes. She didn't realize she was talking so much. She admits there's still a chance she might be wrong about all of it. No, Irene, you're right about that, a voice says. It's Lord Noel. He heard everything. Irene explains she was on her way to see him. The four men can't believe their eyes. Is that Lord Noel? And he's acting like this? Is that the young lord they know? The lord suggests heading to the greenhouse to talk to his lady. And she agrees. As they walk there, Irene notices something. Is she imagining it? Noel steps. Is he trying to walk at her pace? She can't help but laugh. Now she's sure he's doing it on purpose. It's so cute. Noel is confused about what's going on. Irene says sorry and tells him that the way he thinks about her is kind of cute. I am cute, Noel says. The Lord isn't used to getting compliments like that, so he's a bit unsure of how to react. Irene, feeling a bit flustered, clarifies that she was just trying to give a compliment. Noel appears lost in thought. Irene wonders what he's thinking about, hoping he's okay. She tells herself she might be overthinking it. Lord Noel keeps thinking about Lady's words. She called him cute? How can he be cute in her eyes? He's used to people calling him amazing or outstanding, but this is the first time someone's called him cute. Noel wonders what's going on. Why is he feeling this way? It already happened once. Why is he being swayed by her words once more? Finally, the couple reaches the greenhouse. The Lord says that they should have enough privacy here because people hardly come around this place. Irene didn't know this place existed, and she loves it. As they're about to sit, Noel realizes he made a little mistake. There's no food or drinks. Maybe he should have asked Tom to prepare something. Next time, he will ask him. Irene wants to know what Noel wanted to talk about. He explains that he thought Irene loves art and paintings. Irene realizes he probably knows about that because, well, she asked for the notebook and the drawing material. He remembered that, oh, how thoughtful. Irene confirms the Lord is right. He suggests attending an event together and shows the invitation he got earlier. Irene looks at the letter. It's an invitation from Duchess Jasmine? An art exhibition. It's being hosted to sponsor artists who could really use the money. Lord Noel asks if his lady is willing to come with him. Blushing a bit, Irene looks at the invitation and without a second thought, she says, Of course. She's super excited about it. Without realizing it, she ends up really close to Noel. Slowly, she gets back in her chair, trying to laugh off the stress. She thanks the Lord for the invitation and confirms once more that she would love to go. Noel mentions there's still one week until the event, and if Irene wants to buy something, she should tell him. Irene says she'll think about it. A week later, it's time for the art exhibition. Irene is unsure about what to wear. It seems she doesn't have the right dress for the event. She didn't bring any dresses from the Chase Mansion. The clothes Noel prepared are all for casual outings. Irene is disappointed in herself. Why didn't she think about buying a dress until now? No time for tears. She decides. She just simply has to go buy one. Irene checks her drawer where she kept some money. She counts. 12 gold. She was hesitant to use the money that she earned from selling her first painting just to buy a dress, but Noel can't do everything for her. Irene needs a carriage to go to a shop. Maybe Tom can help. Just where are you going in such a hurry? It's her, well, it's the grandfather. Irene explains that she needs to urgently buy something, so she wanted to ask Tom for a carriage. Grandfather wants to know if she's really going out without an escort. Irene didn't think about that part. She's only going to buy a dress after all. Is an escort really necessary? Grandfather is not planning on letting Irene go on her own. He suggests to come with her. She's a bit surprised. Really? His grace wants to come with her? That's a bit strange. The Archduke asks if it's bothering her. Irene says no. That's settled then. They'll ride the carriage together. Now let's shift our focus back to Tom. He wonders what's been happening lately. Everyone is acting so differently ever since Lady Irene entered the scene. Every time he runs into Lord Noel, 
He harasses him with vague and weird questions. Tom, do you think I'm cute? Tom, what's cute about me? And now his grace, Grand Duke Kirsten, is going out with Lady Irene? A person who doesn't spend time with anyone? But when it's about Irene, Tom thought this was all about a contract made out of necessity. A relationship with young Lord Noel that could easily be broken once the both parties achieve their goals. Maybe he's all just imagining this. Tom decides to drop it. He needs to prepare a carriage. It's time to leave. Grandfather enters the carriage and offers his hand to Irene, who is thankful. Off they go. Now, sitting close together, Irene notices that Noel and Grandfather really look alike. Both have straight and thin lips, light brown eyes, and a sweet, deep voice. Is there something on my face? Grandfather asks. Irene apologizes, thinking maybe she was staring a bit too much. However, the Archduke wonders what Irene wants to buy. She explained that she's here to get a dress. The art exhibition is tomorrow. It's important for her to show up in a good dress. She wants to make a good impression since she's going with Noel. Grandfather says she should have told him earlier. He would have bought a dress, but that's not what Our Lady wants. She appreciates the offer, but it's important for her to buy this dress herself for the special event. The grandfather nods, understanding her choice. After a while, they finally reach the town. Irene spots the boutique and is impressed. It's her first time visiting such a large shop. Grandfather says he'll join later. He needs to stop somewhere else first. Irene walks into the shop and gets greeted by a lady. She says she's looking for a dress. Not a customized one, just a finished dress. The mood in the shop changes. The seller doesn't seem happy. She asks if Irene came alone. Why is it that so important to know? Irene mentions she has a budget of 12 gold. The seller seems annoyed, which is strange because 12 gold shouldn't be a small amount. A lady sits down and gets handed a dress catalog. The seller asks if Irene is interested in the accessory catalog, but no, she only needs a dress. The seller responds in a mean tone, saying, Oh, I already expected that. How rude. A couple enters the store and the lady quickly goes to assist them, treating them much nicer. Irene doesn't want to dwell on it. She just needs a dress. She spots a few beautiful ones, but thinks they might be a bit too expensive. Some women in the background are gossiping, making fun of Irene. Seeing how she endlessly turns pages must mean she's not a noble from the capital. Can't you see that she came in alone without an escort? Irene can hear it all, but she decides to ignore it. She continues looking through the catalog. One of the ladies takes it too far and purposely spills her drinks on Irene. She claims she lost her balance and offers to give Irene some money to make up for it. Then she asks which family Irene is from. The couple continue making fun of her, mocking her old-fashioned clothes. Even the guy joins in, contributing to humiliating Irene. But Irene doesn't respond, which irritates the lady. She then reveals herself as a daughter of the Regis family. Irene now remembers. She's heard that name before. Before she left her family, Viscount Regis himself bowed to her father. Now that she thinks about it, she resembles the Viscount a lot. Irene could reveal that she's the daughter of Count Chase, but uh, that would easily solve the situation. But then the world will still reach her parents' ears, and, well, Irene wants to avoid that. She decides not to say too much. It's okay, don't have to worry about me, she says. The redhead is not ready to let go yet. She grabs Irene, calling her poor. Irene wonders if she's going to get hit. She braces herself for the worst, but luckily... Grandfather arrives in time. What the hell is going on? He exclaims. Grandfather demands to know what's going on. Visibly angry. Everyone in the store is on edge. Why is Archduke Kirsten here? Clearly, they didn't expect him in a dress shop. The women are whispering, trying to figure out what he wants. He rushes over to Irene, clearly worried about her. She's soaked. And she looks miserable. Irene says it's okay. She doesn't want to make a scene. Can't you see she needs something to dry herself off with? The Archduke orders one of the ladies to help Irene. He focuses his attention back to Irene and wants to know if someone harassed her. Irene is unsure if she should say it was the lady with the red hair. The couple who mocked her flinch. They realize they did wrong and understand they're in trouble too. Grandfather seems to have figured it all out already. He shoots an angry look at the couple. Are they the ones who hurt you? He asks. The bully seems to be confused. What's going on here? She claims she was just playing with Irene because she looked like a lowly aristocrat who didn't know much. So why is Archduke Kirsten worrying over her? It doesn't make sense. She wonders if Irene is actually a noble after all. Anyways, it doesn't matter. She knows she's in trouble. 
Grandfather gets ready to confront the bully, but Irene stops him. She says she's okay, and that's what matters. Irene doesn't want to involve Grandfather in any, in any of this. She shifts her attention back to the bully. Lady Roses, I was not ingrowing your goodwill, and I don't need any compensation. However, I don't believe it's right to use your status to step on people who are relatively powerless. If Irene really, really had been the daughter of a lower-class family, she would have gotten slapped without being able to fight back. It's also messed up. Lady Roses doesn't know what to say. She apologizes. Irene seems disappointed. She wonders if she will only get apologies from people because of the Archduke. Grandfather can tell Irene is sad. He asks her if she's still planning on getting a dress. Irene is not in the mood anymore. She'll just have to ask one of the maids to get one for her. All she wanted was to wear a dress that she bought herself. But now, she definitely doesn't want to buy it in this boutique anymore. Not after what happened here. The hypocritical seller realizes she made a big mistake. She tries to fix it by apologizing, claiming she didn't know who Irene really is. She suggests bringing out some dresses, but Grandfather stops her right away. It won't be necessary anymore. They will never return to this boutique ever again. The woman knows she's doomed. Everyone in the store saw what happened, and news will spread. No one's going to want to shop here anymore. Irene and the Grandfather are back in the carriage, not saying anything. Irene wonders if he's still thinking about what happened earlier. Then the Archduke finally speaks up. He wants to know if Irene is alright. She says she's fine. The Archduke says that's good to hear. If something like that ever happened again, he demands Irene to come to him right away. It seems like he wants to say more, but hesitating for a second. Suddenly, he pulls out a small box and says, I didn't know what you liked, so I chose what I thought was best. If you don't like it, you can exchange it for something else. What's this? Irene opens the box. It's engagement rings? Grandfather explains, Irene is going to the exhibition with Noel tomorrow. It's going to be a big event, so this is something he wanted to do for her. He was planning on giving them to Noel first, but he would have refused to take them. He's asking Irene if she could pass the ring along to Noel on his behalf. Irene closes the little box, making sure that the rings are safe. Irene thanks the Archduke. She thinks the rings are beautiful. However, she's not sure if she can ask Noel to wear the ring, though. Irene's nervous. She doesn't want to offend Grandfather, but still, she has to say what needs to be said, for Noel's sake. Irene wants to explain. Although I don't fully know what happened between you and Noel, I do, do, do know that Noel was deeply hurt by it. I understand that you're doing this because you care for him, but it may feel like too much to ask him to receive a gift like this. Irene continues and says that she will do her best to share his sincerity with Noel. She apologizes if she's overstepping, but she really wanted to get this off her chest. She also knows she would be taken aback if her family suddenly gave her gifts and said they wanted to be closer. She might even feel offended, and she doesn't want to do that to Noel. Grandfather realizes she's right. He knows it must have been hard for her to tell the truth while looking him straight in the eyes. Even now, when he thinks about it, Irene has always been like this. She's pointing out things that he's clearly missed. Grandfather knows now that the Lady Irene may truly be able to heal Noel's broken heart. She may be able to help mend the right between them. Grandfather apologizes. Seems like he made a mistake by asking. Irene is happy they had this conversation. She's never had anyone listen to what she had to say before. Feels like she's finally being appreciated. After a while, they arrive back at the palace. Irene thanks the grandfather for today, and he thanks her in return. It's been a while since he comfortably opened up to someone like this. It's getting late, and Irene still needs to tell the maids she needs a dress for tomorrow. But wait a second, Irene notices a big box on the table. Who sent this? It wasn't there in the morning. The maid explains that Lord Noel left it there. Wait, Lord Noel did this? Irene opens the box to find the most beautiful blue dress she's ever seen. Was this the dress that was on the first page of that design book? It was too expensive to even consider it. The maid assumes the Lord must have prepared it for her to wear tomorrow. She suggests she should try it on. Irene can't wait, and yes, the dress seems to fit perfectly. Irene wonders if Noel delivered this by himself. And of course he did. He came before she arrived. That means he might be still close by. Irene doesn't hesitate a second. She takes the rings and rushes to get Noel. If she's good now... She could still catch up to him. Irene is rushing, and yes, there he is, Lord Noel. She calls out his name, 
and he turns around. Noel is surprised to see his lady at this hour. She looks exhausted. Is something wrong? He suggests she should catch her breath first. Irene needs to let him know. She knows he left the dress as a gift, and she's really grateful for it. Noel says it's nothing. It's the least he could do for her. It was him who invited her to the event, after all. Suddenly, there's an awkward silence between them. Noel takes a good look at Irene again. She looks stunning in that dress. And, well, he makes sure that she knows. And he continues on. He tells her that he specifically picked it out for her. Irene thanks the Lord. She's really happy with it. The Lord notices Irene is holding something. What is it? Irene has to think about this. Noel might start avoiding her if she shows him the rings, but knowing why the Archduke bought them, she needs to have the courage now. Irene decides to show the rings and says they're a gift by the grandfather. He would be happy if, well, they were to wear them tomorrow at the exhibition. Noel isn't saying anything. He's clearly giving it much thought. Could he be angry? Irene makes sure that he knows that he doesn't have to wear them if he doesn't want to. No one can force him. Noel responds, Irene, what do you want to do? Irene's honest. She doesn't want to wear them. There will be a lot of people there tomorrow. It would be probably better if they showed up wearing matching rings. What did she just say? Irene knows that it's technically true, but she really just wants to wear matching rings with Noel? Noel understands. He doesn't hesitate for a second. He wants the ring, but asks Irene to put it on for him. What? Irene looks embarrassed. Noel explains that rings is a gift from you to me, so I'd like for you to put it on me. Irene is overthinking it a bit. The Archduke gave the rings to her, and she's just passing them along to Noel. Does that still count as her giving the ring to him? Oh, it doesn't really matter. Irene helps her fiancé get the ring on. She notices he has long fingers, well-defined knuckles, and reddish veins. Yes, she's smitten. The ring fits perfectly. Now Noel asks if she can give her hand. She was the one that wanted to wear the matching rings after all, so it only makes sense that she also wears hers. Irene wonders, can you die from your heart exploding? She's in love. It's the next day. We're back at Irene's old mansion. Lady Riel, breed, you have to breed, one of the maids says. Riel keeps coughing, she's struggling. One of the maids wants to help her, but no, Riel doesn't allow her. She's being difficult again. I don't need your help. I'll get there on my own. Don't follow after me, she says. And off she goes on her own. She calls the maids annoying. She thinks they're too loud. Shouting at her won't after do anything after all. And we would have calmly helped me through it, she thinks. I never asked to be born in this body. Suddenly, Riel freezes up. She can hear the maids gossiping. They're saying they miss Lady Irene. She was so mature and calm. Lady Riel is getting more short-tempered by the day. She was never like this before. Her true personality is coming out now, and... She's also basically trapped at home while Lady Irene has found someone and left. The maids continue, saying they they would have left too. Maybe Lady Riel is just jealous. Riel is furious. She thinks she doesn't deserve to be treated like this. This must be all of her sister's fault. Irene, if it weren't for Irene, the maids would have not been treating Riel like this. Has she been standing there all this time, though, they wonder, as they spot her? Her facial expression changes drastically. She pretends to be nice and friendly, asking what's wrong. The maids say nothing. They think Riel didn't hear anything, if they only knew. Riel finds some envelopes and asks if those are the letters they received today. The maid already sorted them all and left Riel's letters in her room. However, she seems to be interested in other letters. The maid explains it's actually Lady Irene's letters. Since she isn't in the manor anymore, she kept them separately. Give them to me, Riel demands. Excuse me? The maid seems really confused. Riel wants to have her sister's letters? The maid doesn't think it's a good idea. She doesn't want to cause any trouble like last time. She can't just hand over the letters. And then, unexpectedly, Riel doesn't hold it in anymore. She will get it her way. She slaps the maid in the face without mercy. That looks really painful. You dare defy me, Riel says. There's nothing I can't do in this house. That means I have every right to read the letters in your hand. The maid is shocked. She didn't see this coming. I'm the one true daughter of this house. It looks like Riel has completely lost her mind. She pretends to be the good person in this situation as she fakes an apology. She says she's having a hard time without her sister, using it as an excuse for her behavior. The maid has no choice and hands over Irene's letters. We see Riel in her room. She's opening every single letter. There's one letter that catches her attention. 
Oh no, it's the invitation to the art exhibition. Riel has an evil look on her face. What is she planning? We're back at the palace. One of the maids tells Irene to open her eyes. Wow, Irene looks stunning. The maids helped style her, and she looks graceful and very elegant. The earrings and bracelet go well with the dress. Irene thanks them. She's happy with the look. It's time to go now. The carriage is waiting. Noelle is stunned, and all Irene can think to herself is how well-dressed Noelle is for today. They look so handsome. They hold each other's hands with a hopefulness and happiness taking over the room. Noelle tells Irene that she looks beautiful today, and she tells him that he looks handsome too. She can only think to herself that they have reached for each other's hands so naturally this time without it being forced. She thinks his hand is warm and comforting. They walk to the exit and all Irene can think to herself is that this isn't a real relationship, so why is her heart pounding so much? We all know, come on girl, you're in love, let's go! She thinks to herself that she needs to calm down and that he's just fulfilling his duty as her escort, thinking that it's any more than that, might make Noelle uncomfortable, is what Irene is thinking to herself. However, Noelle is lost in thought, wondering what's going on. My child, it's the Duke. Irene is shocked by his presence. He wants to tell her that he wishes her to have a great outing and to enjoy herself. Of course, Irene thanks him for his kindness, and he also addresses Noelle. Noticing the ring on Noelle's hand, it shocks him. He actually took it. And he tells him to have a safe trip with a kind tone. Noelle responds he will be safe and have a good time. As the wheels start rolling, Irene decides to tell Noelle, you're a much stronger person than she originally thought. Noelle is shocked, wondering what she means by those words. She says that he wasn't afraid and that if he was afraid and wanted to run away, he didn't and he faced things head on. Noelle responds saying to Irene that it's all thanks to her. And she's also confused now. He tells her that in the past he would have ran away, but now that he has her, that is why he didn't run away, because she is his strength and hope. I love these two so much. Irene is stunned to hear this, but a smile rises on her face and she's happy. She says that it's because marrying her will allow him to become Duke. But those words are a lie, and she knows it because she's being hurt by her own words. She thinks to herself that she shouldn't get her hopes up about real love. She knows the feeling of disappointment. But Noel says this all of a sudden. It's not just that. She asks him, what is it then? Noel says that it's not only the reason he feels so happy and confident. Of course, she helped him with inheriting the title, but he says that even looking at her gives him strength because she's a great person and a greater person than she thinks she is. Irene starts blushing. She's stunned. Noel asks her if perhaps he wasn't a bit forward, and he just wanted to let her know how he felt. Irene yells, You're not being forward at all! She says the words he mentioned make her happy, and uh oh the horse carriage starts to shake, and since Irene was standing up, she looks to about to be falling, but Noel goes in and catches her before she can make the fall, and makes sure she's okay. He says he was worried she might get hurt, but she says she's fine, while they both hold on to each other. She tells him, well, since she is fine, he can let go of her if he wants to. They both feel ashamed and kind of embarrassed and shy as they go back to their seats and start talking about the weather. <laughs> Noelle looks shy, and so does Irene, as they sit in the horse carriage. Noelle is so ashamed that he holds his hand in his face out of embarrassment. He wonders if he is even in his right mind, considering how he acted. He thinks about the fact that he can't keep opening up his heart to her, and that the end of their relationship has already been set, and this will only make things harder for him and for her later down the line. But still, he can't deny these feelings he has for her. Tom stops the carriage and tells them that they have arrived at their destination. As Noelle helps Irene to get out of the carriage, Irene is stunned by the beautiful event and how gorgeous everything looks. It's all sparkling and incredible. We see Lady Giavin, or Jasmine, walk up and say hello to Irene and Noelle, telling her that it's lovely to see them. Again, Irene thanks her for the invitation. She replies saying it's her pleasure and that she should be thanking her for bringing more attention to the exhibition. She also says that on top of that, she's brought a very important figure with her to the event, that of course being Lord Noel. She says it's a pleasure to meet him and thanks for the invitation. She points out that she noticed that they both arrived in the same carriage and well, our boy tells her that 
Well, him and Irene are in a relationship. She's shocked, and she says that she thought it was meant to be some sort of secret, but he replies saying it's not really a secret, and they just aren't making an official announcement just yet. She replies saying that if this were a ball, like the last time, then she would have had a difficulty to keep the news from spreading, but that luckily this is a quiet art exhibition and that she doesn't want to disturb their time together. Irene thanks her for understanding. She says she is thankful once again for them arriving and asks them to have a nice day. They both remain in the same place, dazed, and then decide to finally move. Noel points out that the conversation made him feel kind of dizzy and they both laugh it off. Noel also says that before they head inside, he wants to ask something of her. She wonders what it is, and he replies saying that he's not very knowledgeable about paintings, but that he will stay close to her so she can explain them to him. She's a bit stunned, but also says that she's not that well-versed either, but she will help the best she can. They both chuckle, as she says, to leave it up to her as they go inside. We see people moving around the house looking at all the art, we see Irene explaining one of the artworks called Roar of Kerber, who is a figure that committed crimes for the person he loved. She says that the art looked kind of like a roaring monster the first time, but once you know the story, you know it doesn't look as scary. She thinks of it as a beast that is crying out alone and not noticed by anyone, lonely and left behind. It reminds us so much of what she used to have it like, which is why she can't look away from the artwork. Noel glances at her, and says that the artist probably met the one he loved. Irene is confused. He says that after reuniting with the one he loved, he's sure that he felt so happy that he forgot his painful past. All Irene can think to herself is that there's no proof of that happening, but he makes it sound possible almost. She tells him that she's sure he did, and they both look at each other with a heartfelt gaze. They both feel nice, as if their hearts are at ease in this exact moment. Irene hopes his happiness never. Irene? A voice crackles from behind her. She's caught in pure fear. She knows that voice. When she turns around, there she is. It's Riel standing behind her. Long time no see. It's Riel. She tells Irene that she has missed her so much. All Irene can think to herself is why does this misfortune always come knocking just when happiness finally appears in her life. Riel says that she looks so pretty today, and she goes in to try to grab Irene, but her hand gets stopped. It's Noel. Yes, yes, my guy, keep keep your girl safe. That's, that's a real gentleman right there. Riel looks at Noel in shock and asks him to let go of her hand. Irene is worried, and Riel is confused and furious and angry. Riel says that she doesn't want to cause a scene in such a formal place, and it would be really a shame if Lord Noel of the great Kirsten family was to be caught doing something indecent to a helpless woman, as she grins at him with pure disgust and evil in her face. But Noel just stares her down, and Irene steps in, saying, Riel, you... But she can't get the word out. She's stuck. She doesn't know what's going on. Something seems to be happening. She can't breathe. She wants to get out of here. But she can't do it. She can't make things difficult for Noelle, and she shouldn't keep running away from this. She gains confidence. You go, girl. She has to face this head on. Noelle is stunned. She busts, she's about to say something. Irene tells Riel that they should go outside, as they are supposed to be quiet inside of the art exhibit, so it's not smart to make noise inside for the others. Riel turns around and starts walking, and Irene apologizes to Noelle, saying that she must excuse herself for a moment and apologize for causing trouble, but Noel tells her to not apologize because there isn't anything to apologize for, and he wonders if she doesn't perhaps want him to go with her. But Irene says that this is her problem to deal with and that it's something that she has to deal with. He understands and says he'll be waiting for her at the tea party. Irene walks outside, and Riel stops, says this is a good enough spot to wait in. Riel tells the two guards who were hired by her father to leave her alone for a moment, but the guard says that her father ordered them to take care of her and not let her out of their sight. However, she gets angry at him and asks if he plans to interrupt their conversation. She then goes in and grabs the sword from the guard. And he's totally shocked, yelling out, Lady Riel, what are you doing? She says that the smallest of scratches on her head and the guard will be losing his own head. Irene is shocked and calls out to Riel. But the guard decides to just ask her to put the sword down before she hurts herself. She says that the sword is for her protection and that she will keep a hold of it and demands them to leave. They comply and they run away. 
She then turns around to Irene and asks her if she would prefer it if Riel was to have died. But all Irene can do is be shocked and ask this crazy bitch of a sister what is wrong with her. Has she gone fully insane? She asks her again if she's wrong. She says that her leaving the house is basically telling Riel to die. She says to her that she's struggling and the maids look down on her because Irene is no longer around to look after her properly. She says that Irene has had her fun and that she should come back and that her life is hard enough as it is without Irene acting like this to her. And that unlike Irene, she was born with a weak body. But Irene can't take it anymore. Riel, I told you, I'm not your older sister anymore. Riel freezes. She's stunned once more. Irene says that she has already cut ties with Riel's family and that things won't change anything by doing these pointless and bizarre strange actions. Riel stops her and says that she is so self-assured. She then throws the sword to the ground and flings it as it crashes. Irene realizes that a little bit more force and it could have been possible that sword could have hit her. Riel demands to know what makes her think she can be so arrogant and so brazen when she barely knows anything about herself. Irene says she knows herself quite well, but Riel says no, no, she doesn't. She says that if it wasn't for her family, that she would have already been dead, and says that why is she acting so arrogant and proud? Irene asks her what she means by that. Riel stops herself, just thinking to herself something she doesn't want to say. But Irene asks her what she meant by what she was talking about. Riel turns around and says that she came here to see her specifically on this day that Irene will regret all of this. She says that she came to tell Irene that her leaving the safety of their home and heading down the difficult path is a bad idea, that it's not too late and that their parents aren't as mad as they were before and that she can come back home. But Irene says no, she will never go back to that house and that Riel can leave now if that's all she wanted to say. Riel remains and she is frustrated. She yells out saying, you really think he isn't going to abandon you later? Irene freezes. Riel says that he will cast you aside as soon as he has an opportunity to do so. As long as you're useful to him, he'll keep you. But the moment he finds a better woman along the way, you will become nothing but a thorn in his side. But Irene puts on a smile and tells her, that's not for her to worry about. Besides, that won't happen. Irene is loved much more than Riel could ever imagine. Riel is angry. Irene tells her that she understands what life is like for Riel at home now, and that's why she came looking for Irene today, but that if she tries to go after something that belongs to Irene ever again, she won't hold back the next time. Irene walks away, thinking about the horrible words that Riel had spoken about Noel. She tries to pretend that the words don't hurt, but she knows that to her, Noel, well... He could leave her at any time. If there was a better woman, he could leave because as long as the Archduke Kirsten approved of another woman and approved of the marriage, then Noelle wouldn't need her anymore. She wonders if that was going to happen, then what would happen to her? Irene stops as she hears something being mentioned. It's people. They're talking about Lord Noel. It's two men. They're talking shit about him, saying that and laughing about the fact that he shouldn't be here, and he's already got enough stuff on his plate while mocking him for being a bastard. They ask who would want to marry a man with such an unclear future, and that he's a waste of good looks. All Irene can think to herself is that Noel can hear everything they are saying, but he's pretending that he can't hear any of it, and she wonders how many times he has had to face this situation before. But she knows that worrying about things she can't control is not worth it, and right now, all she wants is to be by his side. She yells out, Noel! Everyone is caught off guard. Noel is caught off guard. It's Irene's voice. She says to him that she's sorry to have kept him waiting. As she approaches him, he says it's all right, and that he was more worried about her, and says that her face is flushed, and wonders if she's feeling warm or sick. She replies saying, she's fine, but, well, she is pretty flushed. She knows it, and she definitely is stressed and anxious about all this attention that's on her and Noel, and just makes her heart race faster when he holds her. We see people whispering and gossiping about them, all having their own unfair and rude opinions. But Irene is happy. Rumors are starting to spread, and she's happy about it. This was her plan. She wants them to see them together. 
Noelle wonders what they should do now, and asks if she wants to keep looking around at paintings. But Irene realizes that they're attracting too much attention, and she's already seen all the paintings she wanted to see, and says it's about time for them to head back as she grabs his arm. She tells him it's because people are watching them, and he understands it's time to leave. Outside the castle, the place looks stunning. Noelle stops Irene and tells her thank you. He's thankful for her approaching him and for holding on to him and for giving him hope. And that meeting, her, was the best thing that ever happened to him. All Irene can wonder is, this isn't a dream, right? No, girl, you're winning. Her heart is so full that she finds it hard to speak. But she replies saying, me too. Me too, Noel. On this sunlit day, a gathering has convened for a purposeful meeting. Individuals, comprised mainly of men, has assembled to analyze the current circumstances surrounding Noel and Irene. This is a problem, one of the men says. I never expected there to be a woman who actually wants to marry that boy. That's not all. Rumors are saying that she's completely won over by the Archduke. If she ends up marrying him, one of the members freaks out and yells they have to get rid of Irene. No matter what! But how are they going to pull that off? They have no idea who she is, and Rumors says that the Archduke adores her. They realize that bringing any harm to her would only hurt them. We also learn that Noelle's cousin is attending this particular meeting. So you're saying we just sit back and watch that boy become Archduke, one of the members says. He redirected his focus towards Noelle's cousin and asks him if he knows anything about Noelle's new partner. He explains he met her only once at the manor. The members expressed surprise upon hearing this. They were unaware. Why weren't they informed? How come he met her? Escardo says Irene didn't look exceptional, so he never expected the Archduke to actually accept her. Everyone here, including Escardo's father, thought the same thing. So naturally, he didn't think too much about it when he saw her. The members don't know what to say. We uncover more about what Escardo truly thinks. He explains he feels like he's been stabbed in the back. Archduke Christian has hated Noel ever since his first grandson passed away. He was always so certain that Noel would never inherit the title. But what changed? Well, Irene Chase. She's the only variable and a person at the center of this chaos. They've already looked into her, and nothing about her stood out. How could a girl like that completely shake everything up? One of the guys interrupts Escado's serious thoughts. He's really straightforward. They must do whatever it takes to stop the marriage. Nobody in this room seems to be up to anything good. You don't need to tell us twice. Then I'll be going now, Escardo says as he's about to take off. We get a glimpse of the past. Specifically, 23 years ago, there was a revolution and a new emperor ascended to the throne. But he was nothing but a puppet. You could say that the Archduke's power currently surpasses even that of the Emperor's. So inheriting the title of Archduke is the equivalent of gaining power over the throne. Escardo is determined. No matter how hard you try, that title is mine, cousin. Now back to the castle. Irene is enjoying her afternoon tea. One of the maids tells her she heard Aine created quite the stir. Apparently, Count Chase's manor is overflowing with invitations for her. All right. Irene realizes that no one knows that she's staying in Noel's castle. After rumors started spreading about her and Noel, people began talking about how the Archduke cares for her too. Things around her began to change. The staff, who used to ignore her, her whispering whenever Irene walked by. And then there are those who were belated 
trying to get into Noelle's good graces. No one is expecting this, but now that I've, well, now that they've heard that the Archduke has accepted her, they're all rushing to adapt. People thought that the Archduke made Noel find a bride because, well, he wanted to give the title to someone else. Such as, well, the person Noel has always been wary of, Lord Escardo. Irene wonders how he feels about all of this. Oh, if she only knew. She's in a creative mood, though. She gets her stuff ready to paint, since running into people could cause more trouble. Noel suggested that they'd stay inside as much as possible. As a result, she's been able to focus on her art. The weather's nice today, though. Irene wonders if she should paint the entrance of the manor. She wants to look outside and opens the window. But then suddenly she notices there are a lot of carriages outside. What's going on? One of the maids explains they're bringing in gifts for the upcoming celebrations. The maid continues and says there will be an event to mark the family's 700th anniversary this next week. They call them gifts, but they're more like bribes to gain more favor with the Archduke. The front gates are always teeming with carriages every year around this time. The 700th anniversary event. All right. That means the wedding announcement is coming up too. Irina's wondering if it's okay if he, well, if he just shits around like this. Is there something she can do? Well, she ran into Tom recently and he looked exhausted. Looking back at it now, was that even Tom or was it a zombie? It must be because of the upcoming event. Noelle must be just as busy too. Should Irene really just be lounging around like this? She really wants to see Noel, but since he's, well, busy, it'll be hard for him to come to see her. Then again, she can't really go out either, since people will be looking for her. The maid is a bit confused. What's the lady thinking about? Oh, looks like Irene's got an ID. Could you help me? Lady Irene, are you sure this is all right? What if you get caught? It'll be fine. Oh, it seems like they've changed their clothes. Irene is going undercover as a maid. She feels a little nervous about this, but she can't just be sitting around here and waiting. She heads outside and says she'll be back out soon. We see two individuals chatting, and they're gossiping about Irene. One of the men says he heard rumors that Lady Irene is staying at the manor. He wonders if it's true or not. It's hard to believe that an unmarried woman would stay at someone else's home for so long. The men have no idea Irene is listening to everything that they're saying. But that's what the person who went to Count Chase's manor said. Lady Irene isn't there. Someone else also said they saw a woman who looks just like her here. So it must be true. It won't be an issue since they're getting married. But I haven't seen her at all. Irene needs to get out of here. She anxiously starts to walk away. She should be fine. She's wearing a maid's outfit after all. However, one of the men notices her right away. He thinks she looks a little suspicious. She even has the same hair color as Lady Irene. His companion says it's ridiculous. Look at her clothes. She's just a maid. Irene's sweating. She almost got caught. She keeps walking and just when she felt safe, a voice called out to her. You there, maid. Let's pretend we didn't hear them. Hey, didn't you hear me? Irene flinches. Then suddenly, Lord Escardo steps in and grabs Irene. Someone spill some water. I'll show you where it is. The stranger is a bit surprised. Escardo asks him if there's still something he needs from his maid. No, he explains he was just wondering if he knew that maid. Huh, he must have been mistaken. Escardo and Irene are alone now. What's happening? No one comes here. You can take that thing off your head now, Escardo says. Irene thanks him for helping her out that situation safely, but Escarta wants a moment of her time in return. Irene instantly rejects him. She has somewhere she needs to go. She's really nervous. She knows Noelle gets tense around this man. It sort of feels like she's betraying him right now. Lord Escardo says he'd really like to talk to Lady Irene right now, but no, it's not doing anything. Irene thanks him once again for helping her out, but she has to go now. 
Escarta wonders if she's planning on visiting his cousin. Hold on. Someone's coming to break up their talk. It's Noel. And he doesn't exactly look happy. He instantly gets close to his lady and grabs her hand. Why do you need to talk to my betrothed? It looks like they're about to have a hell of a discussion. Escarta seems to find it amusing already. Ha! Huh. Betrothed? Irene can feel the tension between the two cousins. He called her betrothed? It makes her blush a bit, but that's not what she should be focusing on right now. Escardo makes it clear. It's amusing to him, since I was able to help your betrothed. I was about to ask her for a small favor. Noel is not having it. He says you can ask him instead. Looks like it's not really working. His cousin responds that it'll be difficult, since he's not the person that he wants to hear this from. Noel seems to not care at all. He tells his cousin Escardo to give up. He'll never have the chance to ask her for a favor again. Noel grabs Irene and walks away. Before facing forward, Irene steals another quick look at Escardo. He smiles and whispers, Next time. Ah, that was a mistake. She shouldn't have turned around. Noel wants to take his lady away from the cousin as far away and as fast as he can. Irene, her hand, it doesn't hurt at all. Noel was gripping it so firmly at first, but now he's being so careful that Irene could slip her hand out if she wanted to. Irene, what happened back there? Noel asks. He wants to know why Irene was with his cousin and why is she wearing that outfit? Irene blushes. She wants to be honest and explains she was wondering how things were going. She wanted to see Noel, but she didn't want the others to see her, so she thought wearing a maid's uniform would help her blend in. But how did she end up talking to Escardo? Irene says some people got, well, happened to almost recognize her, and Escardo got her away from them. Noel's taking a moment to absorb it all. It's making Irene worry. Maybe Noel's angry. Should she apologize? Before she can say anything, Noel decides to say sorry himself. Why is he apologizing instead of me? She wonders. Noel bows and explains, I made you come looking for me. I should have gone to you sooner, but I left everything going on. Keep me away from you. I'm sorry. Irene is a bit embarrassed. He shouldn't be doing this. However, Noel tries to warn his lady. No matter what happens, she should stay away from Escardo. He's a dangerous man and he cannot be trusted. Irene assures her fiancé she won't do anything that will worry him. Irene clenches her fist. Noel notices the little details. He thinks it's adorable. It must be a habit of hers to clench her fists like that. Anyways, Noel's actually on his way to talk to Irene about the 700th anniversary celebration. Oh, so that's how Noel found Irene. She feels sad. All she did was make him upset. Maybe she should have just waited. Sadness is spreading throughout the room. Noel tries to cheer his lady up. He tells her... He's glad she came looking for him. He squeezes her hand and says, He was also worried about those noblemen waiting around the front entrance. They used to exclude him all the time, but now they're trying to butter him up. How fake. But thanks to Irene, he was able to avoid them too. Oh, Irene knows that her fiancé is trying to make her feel better. Maybe she shouldn't have let her emotions show so plainly. After all, this relationship between them is strictly business. But Irene was so emotional that he caught on. She comes to the conclusion that acting this way will only make things more difficult for him. Thank you for saying that, Noel. I'll be more careful from now on. Noel, well, his heart is racing. He always try to keep in mind that they're in a contractual relationship. But Irene's words... They feel like they're piercing his heart. Look at her. Her sweet puppy-like olive eyes. Her honey brown hair and clear skin. He's just lost in her. Damn the boy. The boy wants her. The boy wants her. In two years, they won't be together anymore. So why does he keep forgetting that they're in a contract? It's strictly business. But could there be something more? 
Noel just asks himself, why does he keep doing this to himself? A bit later, Irene and Noel both arrive in Noel's study room. He offers his lady a cup of coffee. As Irene sits down, well, she realizes she's never been in this room before. It looks lovely. She's impressed. Noel must be busy preparing for the big event, but it's still so tidy here. It almost kind of annoys her. Everyone seems to be working hard except for her. The anniversary event aside, the wedding is something important in both of their lives. Noel brings his lady a drink and wants to know what's on her mind. She thanks him for the drink and takes a sip. Oh, it's so sweet. But Irene likes it. It tastes just like a dessert. Noel says he likes sweet things, so he tried his hand at making it himself. Apparently Tom thinks it's too sweet, but not for Irene. She has a sweet tooth after all. Hearing those words makes Noel happy. Irene's surprised. Her fiancé, well, he himself is full of surprises. She wouldn't have expected this from him particularly. It's all in the little things after all. And he made this drink himself. It's just so fascinating. Noel explains the details. The event will start at 6, but they will make their entrance together at a later time to draw people's attention. Tom is the only one who knows that they're, well, announcing their marriage that day. But he'll need the Archduke's permission before anything could actually happen. Noel says he'll go talk to his grandfather about it. Lady Irene wonders if he'll be okay with that. But yes, he'll be fine. Irene has been brave, so Noel should try his best too. Come to think about it, Irene sacrificed a lot. Cutting ties with her family, leaving her home. It couldn't have been easy. But she bravely did that to find her own path. Noel says he should put more effort into this, since Irene has already shown so much courage. Irene understands. She tells her fiancé to not push himself too hard, though. He nods and says that they should hold their wedding soon, soon after they announce it. Irene is a little caught off guard. Her heart's racing like it's a real proposal. One of the maids will help Irene dress for the ceremony, so she shouldn't worry about that. Noel asks his lady if it's okay to bring in a new maid. Irene agrees, but not without a final request. She leans in to whisper something mysterious in her fiancé's ear. What's this mysterious reply? A bit later, Irene was able to get back to her room thanks to Noel. She's also tired. Well, she's really washed up. She has to take a breast. Then, when Irene turns around, she's greeted by a mysterious individual. Hello, future lady of the house. It's a pleasure to meet you. The woman welcomes Irene as the future lady of the house. But Irene feels like it's a bit strange being called the future lady. She says it's nice to meet her. She also tells her that she would be preferring if she called her Irene rather than Lady of the House. The woman says that she was described as the future Lady of the House by the Vice Count Esquan, so she assumed that that was the name she should use for her. She asks if perhaps Irene will allow her to simply call her Lady Irene from now on, and Irene accepts. All Irene can think to herself is that it's cute that Tom describes her as the future Lady of the House to others, which makes her happy. And, well, she's taken aback by it a bit. The woman says her name is Roiselle, and that Irene can call her by that name. Irene thinks the name suits her, because Roiselle is a pretty name. However, Roiselle is a bit shocked, and she wonders if Irene will let her ask a quick question. Irene is surprised and wonders what the question is about. My scar. Everyone I meet always asks me, but you haven't yet. As Royale says those words to Irene and wonders why she hasn't asked about it, the scar. All she can think to herself is that all those who have asked her how she got the scar have always looked at Roiselle with pity and disgust. And once they find out the real reason, they all begin to hate her too. Because I didn't feel the need to ask, Irene says. Once again, Roiselle is caught off guard. Roiselle doesn't understand and wonders why she isn't curious as to, again, why Roiselle has the scars and why they left 
their home to stay here instead. Irene says, no, she's not curious. And she also implies that it's because the scar that Roselle carries is not something that Irene should concern herself with. And that this is how she feels about Roselle's scar simply. Irene doesn't feel the need to pry into other people's lives. And she says that if Roselle wishes to tell her about it, she'd be happy to listen and let her explain. Roselle says that she doesn't want to talk about it. And Irene says, okay, no problem. Once more, Roselle is shocked. This wasn't what she expected at all. And she starts to feel foolish for worrying about how she was going to explain things to Irene before their meeting. It feels strange to Roselle, as no one has ever treated her this way before. It makes her want to protect Irene at all costs. Oh, Irene is confused, so she has a question, actually. She wonders if perhaps the sword isn't too heavy for Roselle. But Roselle says that, well, she is a maid who is skilled in combat, and as such, she feels more comfortable if she's armed with a sword. And wearing that maid dress over her armor also feels nice and cumbersome. Irene wonders if she has to wear the maid outfit, but Roselle says that she was ordered to hide the fact that she's a maid that's also trained in combat, and that can't, she basically she can't do anything about the sword, but she at least decided to hide the armor as requested. Irene is once more just shocked, and thinks about, well, the wedding announcement. When Noelle said that their announcement could make things more dangerous for her, and that's why she has a, well, personal maid, which suddenly changed to be Roiselle, who carries weapons. Is it to protect her? Roselle is curious and wonders why an aristocrat, who is about to be the lady of the house, has any concern for a mere maid like her. Irene tugs at her dress and says that it's because she's still a guest in this house and that she shouldn't be treating others poorly when, well, you're just a guest in someone else's home. Roselle says that, well, she belongs to Irene now and Irene can get, well, anything across to her. And she tells her that she's allowed to speak to her in whatever way she wants to. Irene accepts it and they both smile at each other. She also tells Roselle that Roselle has a really pretty smile. Roselle blushes and asks Irene to not do any teasing like that. But Irene freaks out saying that it wasn't teasing, it was being serious. We see Noel sitting in his office. He's asking for the paintings that he requested. And as the paints are handed to him, he's told that it was not easy to purchase as rumors have spread that he was on the search for all of them, but it was possible to purchase these at an auction just in time. Tom wonders why he suddenly wanted them, but Noel says that it was Irene's ID. As Noel's reading some letters, he reads, The Future Lady of the House? What's with the title? Tom says it's because they aren't married yet, and he hasn't inherited the title of Duke either, so the Lady of the House should be Future Lady of the House. Noel just thinks it's all weird to him. Tom also says that Roselle thought it was a memorable title for now. But Noel wants to know if anyone else knows about Roselle and the fact that Roselle is also a guard. Does anybody else besides Tom and Irene know this? Tom confirms that, yes, they're the only ones that know about this and that Roselle has also hidden her armor underneath a costume made to look like a maid uniform. But she still does carry a sword around. Noel, well, he would still prefer if Irene was protected by himself only, but he can't help the current fact that she needs a guard. He asks Tom to protect her from any harm that may come her way, and with a worried expression, Tom accepts. But all can, Tom can think about is that, well, he's struggling to adjust to this side of Lord Noel, as is different from his usual self. Noel gets up out of his chair, and Tom wonders where he is headed. Noel replies, it's time to see his grandfather. And Tom is shocked. Alone? Noel is going to see him alone? He's asking him if perhaps maybe Tom should accompany him. Noel thinks that he'll be fine. He needs to do this on his own. As he walks through the halls of the mansion, he stares into the ceiling, wondering to himself if perhaps he hasn't been in this area by himself in a long time of the house. He looks at the door in front of him 
as he remembers how it felt impossibly big to enter them when he was a mere child. It felt like they would forever stay close to him because of their size and weight. But he takes the courage and knocks on the door. Grandfather, it's me. May I come in? He's caught in pure fear. It's always been this way. Even though he was in there and could definitely hear him, he could hear everything. He just wouldn't want to answer. And he would never respond. And he would also deny permission to Noel to access the room until he allowed him in, which was essentially never. Noel is used to it, but it still hurts. As he's about to grab the door himself to open it, he hears a voice. Come in. Noel is shocked. He opens the door and walks inside. Grandfather isn't sitting in his usual chair. As he turns around and sees him, Noel is surprised. He's not in his usual place and his expression is not that of hatred like usual. The grandfather puts down a paper he was reading and he wonders what brought Noel here today. Noel stands with the paintings in his arms and tries to get together the strength to finally talk to his grandfather. Grandfather wants to know what his grandson is doing here. Noel gathers his courage. He shows him the paintings and says, Irene got it for him. Grandfather appears somewhat surprised as he takes the paintings. Inspecting it closely, it's a piece by Carr titled Room. They say he can hold any and all thoughts that a person has while looking at it. So it's seen as an empty but warm room. Well, says Irene said he'd like the painting. Turns out she was right. The Archduke explains, This artist always aims to create such an arm and cozy painting. It's what I like best about these works. Irene has a great eye for art. Noel agrees with the statement. He has quite an interest in art. Grandfather asks his grandson to thank Irene. The painting really makes a wonderful gift. Grandfather carefully examines the paintings. Its significance appears to hold great meaning for him. If I may ask, what does that room hold for you? Noel asks. There was something once, something I wished for, but it's no longer possible. It's obvious who he's talking about. Noel is not even going to tr give it a try. Talking about that right now won't get them anywhere. Maybe he should just go back. But then the Archduke says something unexpected. But chasing after something you cannot catch is foolish. Noel is stunned. Is this for real? It can't be a dream, right? I realize that now. Though I admit it took me far too long. So I put all the things I can no longer reach into this painting and face reality from now on. Noel, my child, grandfather gets up and does a bow. He apologizes that it took him so long. He's ashamed and he admits that he has wronged Noel. Where is this coming from? Those are the words Noel has been waiting for to hear for years. He's clearly emotional. He wants to know why his grandfather is acting like this all of a sudden. Grandfather explains that he knows too much time has passed. He doesn't expect Noel to forgive him. His immaturity, ego, and greed has hurt his grandson after all. He continues and says, as the person who wounded him, he simply wishes to give him the apology he deserves. Noel just can't comprehend it. The Archduke set forth a near impossible condition to ensure that he wouldn't inherit the family title. It's revealed that grandfather had other motives. It was not that he didn't want his grandson to inherit the title. He was actually trying to protect him from those who wished to harm him. Noel is ready to ask the question. Can Irene and him have this permission to get married? It doesn't take grandfather too long to answer. The answer is yes. He feels that Irene is someone he can entrust this place to. He loves Irene too. She's a great woman. Grandfather makes it clear that he's very profound of Noel too. Noel's a little caught off guard. He finally achieved the thing he's always wanted, but why does it feel like he can't breed? Noel tries to put his feelings aside for now. He says they're planning on announcing the marriage at the upcoming ball. They'll hold the ceremony soon after. He needs the permission to do so. The Archduke is agreeing with all of it. 
He will give all the help they need. He even suggests that the three of them should have a dinner together. And that way, Irene can formally be introduced to him. Noel is fine with it. It looks like the conversation is over. Noel leaves the room. Grandfather is sad. He realizes that Noel is not ready to give it to him yet. The trust. And he thinks this is all his fault. He takes another look at the painting. I miss you more than usual today. Noel really needs some time to let everything sink in. Grandfather bowed to him? If he really did set up the marriage clause to protect him, that basically means he wanted Noel to inherit the family title, but why? Why does Noel feel so angry? Maybe Irene can help. Maybe she'll be able to explain why he's feeling this way. Maybe he'll be asking too much of her to talk about such personal matters, but Noel really doesn't want to keep avoiding this. Back to Irene. The maids are taking her measurements. Roizel is there too, undercover. She says they'll work hard to create a dress that suits Irene as soon as possible. Irene thanks everyone for their hard work. She sits down and says she's feeling tired. Roizel kneels and offers her a foot massage. It makes Irene feel a bit uncomfortable. She doesn't need that, right now at least. Roizel seems to be offended. Is this a sign that her own master doesn't trust her? Irene doesn't want to come off as rude, so... Well, she lets Roizel massage her feet. She's never done something like this before. It's a bit strange. But after a while, Irene can feel her body starting to relax. This ain't too bad, man. Suddenly, Roizel gets up. She heard something. What's going on? There's someone on the other side of the door. And they've been there for a while. It's very suspicious. Roizel is ready to protect Irene. She wants Irene to stay behind her. Roizel approaches. Hmm. As she approaches, it doesn't make the person on the other side run away. Which means they want to enter the room. Roizel opens a door and gets her sword out. Irene is scared. Who is it? It's Lord Noel? What does this mean? Even Irene looks a bit surprised. Are you going to put that sword down? My apologies. I simply wish to protect Lady Irene, Roizel says. She wants to know, though. Why was Noel hovering in the front of the door instead of coming inside? Noel's face is a bit red like a tomato. I really hope he's not into feet, because that would be weird. Lord Noel is in the room. Irene questions why he was hovering around the door, though. Lord Noel is embarrassed, and he says he actually came to speak to her directly. With both of them being confused, Irene asks why he didn't simply just walk inside. But Noel is embarrassed about the whole situation, so instead... Irene asks Roselle if, well, he could give them the room, and they need to talk in private. Roselle leaves and stands guard at the front door. Noel is feeling very strange. He's never seen Roselle get attached to someone so quickly before. She's very strange. She's even wary of him. Irene laughs. <laughs> is that so? She asks him. As they drink their tea, she asks Noel what he wanted to talk about. Noel decides to tell her that he went to speak to his grandfather about the marriage announcement. He also tells Irene that he gave him the paintings that she asked for, and she's so happy to hear it and wonders if, well, it wasn't too hard to find them. Well, he just replies, saying that he gave his blessing for our marriage. Irene is stunned. That's great news! She's so happy, but Noel isn't. His face doesn't look happy at all. Irene is worried and wonders if perhaps something is wrong or if something happened. Noel tells her, my grandfather apologized to me. Noel is slowly breaking down. He tells her that grandfather said he was sorry and admitted that he was wrong and that he wronged him over all these years. But even though he told them all this stuff, Noel has always wanted to hear it from him for so long, but Noel still feels frustrated. Something is irking him and bothering him. He feels like he's going to explode with all these emotions swirling around through his mind and body. He asks her if she knows what this feeling he's having might be. He says he's so sorry. He didn't mean to put her in such a tight spot. Irene says that she's tried to imagine that she was in his shoes and that, well, she tried to imagine what it would be like if she was to get an apology from her family and how that would make her feel. But she thinks the only thing she would feel would be sorrow. God damn, man. They, they can't hurt our girl's feelings. Irene tells Noel. 
that if her family were capable of apologizing, they would have done it by now. So what's the point? She states that if they treated her a little better, then she wouldn't have been here to begin with. How is she supposed to act today if they suddenly apologized? She thinks that she would have thought of it as something nice, but she would have preferred it if it came sooner. Noel agrees. He thinks that that may be what he is feeling. It just came too late. Noel thought the grandfather would always be having his back, but Noel, well, for him, suddenly turned around and apologized. It was weird. It made Noel feel so foolish for having suffered all this time. He watches Noel's eyes fill with tears and they stream right down his face. Bro, this is going to make me cry, man. Goddamn. Noel sees the tears in his eyes and it hurts her. So she stands up and runs over to Noel, grabbing him and hugging him, telling him that it's okay to cry. Oh, dude, I love this couple. Noel is shocked. It's okay to struggle with this. and It's okay to be feeling angry, she tells Noel. She also tells Noel that he doesn't need to forgive his grandfather if he doesn't want to, and he should just do whatever makes him feel better instead. Noel is shocked, but Irene continues. If it feels like he has no one to turn to, Noel can always come to her and tell her how he feels. Noel is worried and asks if that would be all right for him to do. Irene stares him in the eyes and reiterates that of course, and that if he is ever struggling, he just needs to seek her out and ask for her help. Because I am on your side, Irene tells him. All Irene can think to herself is how Noel reminds her of, well, how she also feels, given that they are both suffering from a similar situation and scars, and having each other helps as they can support each other. But she also hopes that Noel can learn to trust her as much as she trusts him. Then, Irene, well, you should also tell me when you're having a hard time, Noel tells her. Which surprises Irene, but he wants to be of help for her as well. He wants to do good things for her too, and help her out too. Irene, however, feels that he's already helped her so much to begin with. She thanks him for the offer, and says she'll be sure to come and talk to him whenever she needs help. It seems that the times are getting kind of late, so Noel decides it's about time for him to leave. Irene decides to walk with him into the hallway. Noel also points out that the next time he wants to actually have them meet in the greenhouse, as he's ordered refreshments to be prepared there for the next time. As he's about to reach the door, he turns around and tells Irene that he's feeling much better thanks to her, but Irene is just glad she could help him out. For the next time, Noel hopes that Irene can share more about herself to him, as he wishes to learn more about her. Irene turns and is stunned, but instantly the joy springs out of her, and she smiles at him, saying that she will definitely do that next time they meet. As the two of them split up, and Noel exits the room. He walks out of the room, but all he sees is Roselle staring at him with an angry demeanor about to eat his face. Noel is annoyed and tells Roselle to not stare at him, with Roselle being sure to tell him goodbye in a tone that is clearly annoyed. <laughs> As Noel walks away, all he can think about is perhaps he's chosen the wrong maid for this job. Hmm. The night has hit, and the stars are shimmering in the sky as Irene lays in her bed, and all she can do is stare at the ceiling. She's thinking to herself, she feels jealous. She knows that even after everything she has been through, she's never received an apology. If they really were late with an apology, would she be able to expect it or even accept it? She wonders. In the past, she might have forced herself because they are her family, but things are different now. She has Noel, and she feels that she now has a place that isn't the family home, but she also knows that once two years have passed, the contract will end and she'll probably end up totally alone. Aw, oh, girl, come on. You know Noelle loves you. Like, this is so stupid. She doesn't have to worry, man. We all know you're fine, girl, okay? Oh, Irene is stressed and she clenches her blanket as she tells herself that this is not the time to think about that. She turns over and forces herself to go to sleep. As a new day dawns upon us, we watch as the maids run around the house, busy as ever. It seems Irene is being fitted for a new dress. We see a very stern and angry looking lady who observes Irene and a maid putting a pair of shoes on her. Irene thinks to herself, they are perfect. And the angry lady says that now that they've chosen the shoes, it's time to try on her dress. And there isn't much left, to, uh, I guess, to do until the ball, so they must hurry. Irene is a bit embarrassed and just agrees. As they weren't able to ask for Irene's input for the dress, 
and then a tight schedule, decide to simply make it with their own IDs, but they hope she likes it. The lady wonders if Irene, well, you know, likes it, what she thinks of it. She says that she tried to match her coloring so they use sapphire, amber, and pearls. And the woman keeps yapping on about the details, but all Irene can think to herself is how pretty it is, and she totally ignores her. <laughs> they hurry and start putting the dress on Irene, rustling around with all the small details, and fixing up Irene's hair, and last but not least, the necklace. All the maids look flabbergasted as they take a look at Irene. She looks stunning. Irene looks stunning in a new dress. As she looks in the mirror, she can't recognize herself. She wonders why she looks like a completely different person. Has she ever shined like this before? You always shine, girl, okay? We all know it. Irene thinks to herself about the fact that she'd always thought that extravagant dresses and jewels didn't suit her. Her maids compliment her and tell Irene she will definitely be the star of the event tonight. This dress will become popular with the ladies, and more people will start looking for sapphire, amber, and pearls. Rizal can't resist to compliment the lady, just saying, you shine brighter than anyone I've ever worked for. Irene is happy to hear the kind words from the maid and thanks him. The other maids bow. They're about to leave as their work is complete. Our lady can't quite believe it. Her whole life changed so much in such a short time. A knock at the door breaks into her thoughts, though. Irene, it's me. May I come inside? Oh, it's Noel. He's here to escort Irene. The event will start soon. They really have to leave now. Noel didn't see it at first, but now he can't miss it. He looks at his fiancée and realizes how incredibly beautiful she is. He seems speechless, just staring at Irene. She wonders if something's up with the Lord, but yeah, he hasn't said anything. He blushes and says, there's nothing. It's time to go. Rizelle wants to stick with her master, but Noel wants to chat privately. He tells Rizelle to stay back and guard the room. He explains that an assassin might hide in here and wait for Irene to return. Noel wants to stay by Irene's side tonight, so Rizelle doesn't need to worry. She tells Noel she understands. She's ready to guard the room. The couple is about to make their first appearance. It's almost time. Irene can't stop shaking from the nerves. This is really an important event. She can't afford to make a mistake. Get a hold of yourself, Irene. You can do this. Lord Noel sees that, well, his lady, she's nervous. And he wants to help. So, he tells her he's nervous too. Surprising Irene because she doesn't think he's nervous at all. Noel says he's definitely nervous. Who wouldn't be? The only thing is, he's trying hard to not show it. Irene thought Noel would be perfectly fine. But he's just human too at the end of the day. His words seem to have helped her calm down a little. It's really time now. The couple is about to enter the room. Announcing the arrival of Lord Noel Kirsten and Lady Irene Chase. A bunch of folks came to the event. Everyone's eyes on our favorite couple. They really do look good together. Noel blushes and whispers to Irene, You look beautiful today. She compliments him back, You look great too. As they're making their way through the crowd, Noel wonders if Irene wants to go to the greenhouse again after they're done here. They could enjoy a cup of tea there. That sounds lovely. In the distance, they are both being watched by the Grand Duke who sits on a throne next to someone we've yet to meet. Well, Irene is worried. The room is quiet and the music stopped. She wonders if it's because of their appearance in the room, perhaps? Maybe that's why everything went quiet? People are whispering about Irene. Some are giving compliments about how good they look together, and others are just whispering pure lies and anger. The Grand Duke finally speaks, asking for the banquet to continue. With everyone starting to dance once again, Noel reaches his hand out to ask Irene for a dance. If she would like it, of course. With pleasure, they grab each other and begin their dance. But all Irene can think about in her mind is the words her mother would speak. Irene, you're not a good dancer. Be sure to hide away, somewhere to avoid being asked to dance. She droops her head thinking about how her bitch of a mother treated her and is worried about making a mistake. Irene, when we're dancing, please look at me, Noelle tells her. She whispers to him that she's worried she might make a mistake, but Noelle assures her that it's all right. A mistake isn't a mistake if no one can see it. He asks her to put her trust into him and look up at him. Everyone in the room is smitten by the beauty and grace displayed by Irene and Noelle. They think they look perfect together. And as they start dancing, she makes 
a little mistake right away and apologizes to Noel, freaking out. But he just tells her to calm down. No one even noticed. Look, it's totally fine to just keep going. She feels more confident once he tells her that. And as they're finishing up their dancing, the music finally stops. Together they stand in front of the Grand Duke and another man next to him, presumably the Emperor himself. They bow and apologize for making a late entrance. The Grand Duke replies that it's fine and he mentions seeing them both dancing and tells Noel that they were really good at it. The whole room is stunned. Did they all really just hear that? They all thought the Grand Duke and Noel were on bad terms. They're shocked to hear them being on such good terms. It's genuinely shocking. As everyone is left stunned in the room, Irene and Noel move forward. But Irene stops. She looks at something above her. It's the painting. She remembers being told that only specially selected paintings may be displayed at a ball and that the paintings must be really well attuned to the space so they don't detract from anything else and the artist must also be relatively well known but in this moment the paintings hung in the center of the ballroom and one of them was the painting she gave him it breaks all the unspoken rules it is not supposed to be here grandfather says he's very happy with his painting that she gifted him so he decided to hang it here and he wonders what she thinks of it Everyone in the room is shocked and they are confused as to what's going on between His Grace and Irene. The whole time Irene can feel their stares just piercing her and she knows that there's skill at picking up on body language and different hidden intentions. So there's no way they missed His Grace's intention behind being so outwardly affectionate towards her. She knows she has to focus deciding to tell her grandfather that she's honored that he enjoyed it so much, which makes her happy. Of course, grandfather replies saying that he's truly grateful to have received such a wonderful gift. He then speaks to the whole room and tells them all that he's thankful that they've all gathered here today and that they're celebrating the family's 700 year history, which is quite incredible. He says that he also hopes that they can all set aside their troubles and differences for the night and just enjoy the amazing festivities and fun. As he says that, the music then once again starts to blare and people are moving around and dancing. As two people walk up behind Irene and Noel, we notice that they seemingly want to ask them something. They both say, excuse me. As Noel notices them, he just grabs Irene's hand and walks away from them, leaving the girl and the guy both annoyed and feeling awkward. Irene wonders why Noel did that, but... He tells her that it's nothing good or nothing good will rather come from allowing themselves to be crowded by people and Tom will be arriving soon so he also wonders if she would like to just wait on the terrace and the balcony until then which she agrees to. They both walk on to the terrace where Irene feels a lovely breeze as the wind is blowing into her air. Noel calls out to her and she wonders what he wants. He steps in close to her and Irene leans back against the edge of the terrace at the edge of the balcony, being a bit anxious, and as it feels like Noelle is about to kiss her. Ooh, let's go, dude. He asks her to stay still for a moment, and she wonders if he's about to kiss her. Oh, dude, let's go, let's go, dude. But no. He noticed that her ribbon was untied, and he wants to help her fix it. And all she can think about now is why her mind decided to go there. (laughs) We all know why your mind went there, girl. Noelle starts to worry. Irene is really red and he's scared she might have caught a cold. I mean, they are outside at the end of the day. But Irene is embarrassed and says, no, she's fine. But she does say she's actually a little hot. So, Noel goes in to touch her forehead. But just as he does it, he hears the rustling of drapes behind him. Hey, you my father, it's Tom. And he has been looking for them. But Irene and Noel stand together stunned. And Tom asks what they're doing. But it's all clearly, well, just immeasurably awkward of a situation. It looks like they're about to kiss and Tom found them. Now, Noel feels ashamed and says nothing as they're ready to go now. And Tom says that they have placed guards all around the area so no one can approach. And they made sure that all the important parties that need to be in the area have gathered. Noel wonders, however, about Ascardo. But then again, Tom tells him and reiterates that it appears Ascardo has decided to not attend today's events. So Tom is not totally sure what he's up to. 
Noel asks Tom to guard the doors to make sure that not even an ant is able to crawl inside. He then turns to Irene and tells her, it's time to head back inside. But he stops. His hand hangs in front of him and all he can think about is whether she will try to avoid him again. His mind floods with stress and all he thinks is that it doesn't really matter if she won't hold his hand because they just need to walk back together anyways. But as he looks at his hand, he wonders, why does he feel so nervous? He wonders if he's scared that she might reject him again. Why is this happening? Why is Noel being filled with so much fear and dread? He wonders what's wrong with him. But a hand reaches out. It's Irene. She grabs his hand on her own with a cute smile on her face, telling him, let's head inside. He replies, all right, and the two of them go inside. With the light being bright, Irene and Noel stand together. Walking through the room, they approach His Highness and the Grand Duke. Noel bows and says that if they allow it, he would want to make an announcement tonight. His Highness, well, he's curious. His Highness is thinking over it while the Grand Duke asks him if it's all right. He says it's interesting. He, the Crown Prince, is very intrigued. Hmm. We learn that he has always been a man who enjoys intrigue. He would never turn down anything as long as it's something which makes things interesting to him. He always wants to see things played out. Even if those things include death and things of even inhumane nature, as we see flashes of images reflecting a dark past and a secretly evil nature that's held within this crown prince. This whole situation is almost impossible for him to ignore, as he definitely would never ignore such a intriguing moment. He says that he would like to hear what Noel is planning and what he wants to announce. One of the other men from the family says that it's the 700 year anniversary and they should not be entertaining any dumb announcements from Noel. But the Grand Duke stops him in anger. Do you wish to go against his highness's wishes? He says as he stares the man down. All they can do is have chills round their, their spine and recall back. The crown prince says that they can proceed with their announcement. Noel, of course, thanks the crown prince and bows as he grabs Irene's arm and walks away. Irene can feel from Noel's hand that he is nervous, but she's also nervous because she knows how big this moment is for Noel. But she also knows that everything is going to be all right. She tells Noel that he worked so hard to prepare for this moment, so she's sure it will go well. He smiles at her and thanks her for calming him down. They then stand and face the crowd as he decides to say, We would like to make an important announcement. I, Noel Kirsten, wish to announce my engagement to Lady Irene Chase. Right before the announcement was about to take place, we see that Irene was able to look out throughout the whole ballroom. In a corner, she spotted her parents. They're both here and she was hoping that she wouldn't have to run into them. She thinks that they are definitely down there wanting for her to go down, well, and follow them home. But all she thinks is, no, she will never go back there again. And you shouldn't, girl. You're not going to be going back to that horrible family. Irene decides to just avoid them. She just doesn't even look at them. And she instead tries to look around the room where she spots someone else. It's Ascardo, and he's shrouded in some weird blue mist. Irene feels like something is off. She wonders what these blue wisps coming from his necklace are exactly. She thinks that they feel so strange, but no one is paying any attention to them. She wonders if Noel can not see them either. We watch as the blue smoke comes further and further up and closer and closer to Irene and Noel. She starts to freak out. She looks at Escado again and she knows something isn't right here. Escado whispers to himself, It's too late, while staring at Irene in the eyes. She reads his lips and wonders what he means by that. We see as Noel is saying the words from the announcement from earlier, but just then the smoke reaches him and Irene is starting to panic. Will it do something to him? Will it hurt him? What is Escardo trying to do? No! A voice whispers, As you wish. Just as she yelled that, the voice came into her head. All of a sudden, all the smoke dissipates, and Escardo is shocked. What? Why is it all coming back to me now? He says. Noel then continues with the announcement. As we watch Escardo run away, exiting through a side door, Irene wonders what just happened, but Noel tells her the ball is coming to an end and that he would like for the two of them to go spend some time alone now. 
but Irene only thinks about what just happened. What was that? What were those blue wisps? Hmm. She recalls the voice. A voice in her head. As you wish. Who said that? Was that a voice just in her mind? But for now, she just have to leave with Noel rather than continuously thinking about this. We change scenes and we see Count Lixus's manor. The blue gem necklace is being thrown to the ground. It's of course Escado and he's angry and frustrated. He was assured that this thing was the real deal. He wonders if it was fake, but he recalls that it definitely had that cold energy rushing through his body when he wore it. So he wonders, why did it stop working halfway through? He wonders if it could be because of Irene stopping it from happening. He's frustrated. There's no way she knew what was happening. This object, this necklace, has never been used or seen before. He sits down, folding his face in frustration. He was unable to stop the wedding announcement, and they will probably think that he can't touch them now that the announcement has been made. But, Noel, you're sadly mistaken, he says to himself. While grinning in anger, he reiterates that Noel can't get rid of Escado that easily. <laughs> Back at the mansion, we see a beautiful fountain and some tea. Noel has handed lemon verbana tea to Irene, and he has heard that it helps with fatigue and clearing one's mind. Irene blows in the mug and points out that it truly smells great. She then takes a moment and asks Noel something, but he asks her if perhaps they should head back. But Irene wonders why. They only just arrived here. But he's just worried about her. He wonders if she just wants to go back inside where she might be, you know, able to rest a bit if she feels tired. Irene grabs her face, shocked that he would think that, but realizes she must have been giving, you know, him a bunch of worries, especially from her expression. She tells him she's not tired, but that she just had something on her mind. Noel asks if she wouldn't mind telling him what that is. She goes ahead and tells him, I saw Lord Escardo at the ball earlier. He was wearing a necklace that was given off strange wisps of smoke, but she continues explaining. And finally, after everything's been explained, Noel tells her that he had no idea such a thing was happening while he was making the announcement. She tells him that perhaps she imagined things, but Noel doesn't think that is the case. He is sure that Escarda was probably up to some nefarious things. However, Noel is, isn't exactly sure why Irene was the one well, the only one that could see the blue mist. But also, why did Escardo's plan fail? And who's that voice Irene heard? She's shocked. He actually believes her? He replies, of course, I trust you. She's again just flabbergasted, but so happy to hear those words. He tells her he will try to look into everything. And she should have, well, she, well, she did the right thing by telling him today. And, well, she should come to his office to see him anytime she needs any help. And if she needs anything very soon, she should come there. She wonders why that's the case. Well, he tells her, of course, did you not forget that from tomorrow, we're going to be side by side every day? Irene is startled. D does that mean they'll be sharing a room? As Noel is trying to calmly explain that from tomorrow, he'll be doing everything from his, well, room, Irene is freaking out and yells, the, the, There are eyes all around the manor, so wouldn't it be better if we use separate rooms till the wedding? Noel is thinking to himself that he was about to tell her that he was just going to be working in a room right next to hers starting tomorrow. I wonder if she was thinking that he was about to announce they will be sharing a room. But he's happy and decides to tease her a little bit more. He says that, if that's what she wants, then it's fine. He doesn't mind it either way, since, well, they'll be sharing a room once they get married anyways. Irene is just stressed and feeling a bit nervous. <laughs> he notices she looks flustered and thinks perhaps he should stop as, well, he was just trying to tease her a little bit. So he tells her he was just joking and that they will have separate rooms. But before he can say that, Irene says, if you're okay with it, then so am I. Uh-oh, Noel messed up. His idea of just teasing her has backfired, but he decides to come clean and he tells her that he was just making a joke and just, well, messing with her as he was trying to tell her that he'll be doing his work in a room right next to hers. Irene finally realizes and is feeling embarrassed, but 
Noel stands up and says, well, it's getting late, so they should be heading inside now anyways. Irene is all red in the face, and all she can think about is how she fell for his joke. But she also notices that Noel was also blushing, just as, you know, she was. So she wonders, did she really see that? Did he also blush? Do they both share feelings? Inside of the mansion, Irene thanks Noel for the tea, and he says he will make sure to prepare more of it next time too. As they stand at the opening to her room, they both aren't sure exactly what to say or do. Well, Noel finally says goodnight to her and tells her not to forget that he'll be in the room next, next to hers if she needs him. As they both say goodbye and goodnight, the door closes and he finally just stands there holding his face, blushing and freaking out. He was almost about to ask her if he could join her in her room. Ooh! Not that he wanted to be in there for any special reason. <laughs> sure, buddy. But rather, he just wants to spend more time with her. Aw, that's cute. He turns around and wonders once more why he feels like this. He feels that he needs to be careful to not let his true feelings for her show, as he doesn't want to let his love for her show. Aw, these two are so amazing. <laughs> as the morning on a new day breaks, the ball continues. As usually, balls last around seven days, but since this is the Kirsten's family's 700-year anniversary, the ball will last less than three. This is because of the shocking announcement that Lord Noel made on the first day, as this instantly caused the press to work non-stop to publish the news immediately afterwards. And overnight, Irene became a celebrity. Everyone would go around gossiping about the young lord's new fiancé, and even, well, it even made the maids in the Duke's Manor start chatting about it non-stop. But funny enough, it seems that Lord Noel and Roselle's strict security must have worked as we watch guards being, you know, really strict and taking away reporters and Roselle threatening anyone who tries to bother or even approach Irene. Like, nobody can even come close to them. Irene could notice all of this since, well, her life was so quiet, just like the eye of a storm. We see Irene sitting and drawing something as she realizes it's almost time to go up and meet with Noel. She knows his room is next to hers, but it's still quite a far bit away for walking. As she walks, she hears the name of her own being screamed out from her back. Irene! Everything was fine until they showed up. She turns around and it's them again. It's her parents. Her mother runs up and hugs her, saying that they have missed her. Irene just says mother while having an annoyed look on her face. The mother asks why she did not come talk to them at the ball and wonders if she's been eating well as she looks thinner. But Irene is ice cold and quiet. Rosella appears and throws her sword towards the mother's throat. This is what I'm talking about. Get that bitch. <clears throat> Sorry. The mother is shocked. W what are you? The father comes yelling. What is the meaning of this? Rosella asks Irene if she's hurt. But she says that she's all right and thanks Rosella for saving her. Roselle also tells you, Irene, that she can go right ahead and she's going to deal with these intruders. Irene's father yells, What intruders? How dare you speak like that to us as a mere maid? Irene says that it's all right, Roselle. They're just people that she knows. She then, with a boss bitch demeanor, asks them why they are here. The mother says, Irene, why are you talking to us like that? Are you still upset about what happened before? She says that. It appears that they've not been that attentive to her needs. She continues and says that they didn't realize how lonely she was feeling because they were busy taking care of Riel, and they've been reflecting on that. They say to her to, well, come home, as they're still her parents. The father bows and apologizes as well, saying that he'll be sure to respect her personal time in the future, but still is a dick and says that she should please stop worrying them and come home. Irene, with the boss energy that she has, tells them that leaving the house was not a decision she made impulsively, and that if she goes back, she'll have to be in the nice daughter again, the nice sister, all over, trembling in fear where, well, any moment she'll be abandoned again, and that'll never happen again. She's grateful to them, both for giving her a warm bed and three meals a day and a place to, well, grow up in good health. But most of all, she thanks them, as without them, she wouldn't have met Noel. But this is the end for her. She's realized that affection is not something you should have to yearn for. 
That house is no longer my home. That's right, Irene. It's Noel. Oh, there's our champion. <laughs> he looks stunning, and he comes up behind Irene, holding her by his side. She looks at him, and she, well, he says that, well, he was running late. And, of course, well, that's why she came looking for him. With a cold stare, he looks at her parents. Interesting. The party's over, so why are you still here? Especially in a place that can't be accessed by just anyone. Ugh, the father is stunned. Anyone? We aren't just anyone. We're Irene's family, he says. He looks at Irene and basically tells her that, well, them being Irene's family is something that she might disagree with. And she agrees with Noel. He's right. The father is shocked. Irene, you really? And then she just stops him. You two pushed me away first, she tells him. And father, you're the one who said that I would regret this. So I don't understand why you're here right now. The father yells again. You're our daughter. We're your family. Why can't that be enough? We're your family. You should be understanding of us. Irene stops him. So you still don't care about how I feel? If family means being able to hurt others so easily, then Irene is sorry, but she doesn't think she can be the family that they want her to be. So please leave, she asks them. The father is furious. He can't believe her. Noel tells him if, well, that even if he's a count, this behavior that he's portraying is very unacceptable. And that if the parents don't leave, Noel will make them leave. The parents are scared and freaked out and decide to head out, but the father, father still can't stand the disrespect anymore. So before they leave, the father says that Irene, later you'll figure out just how big of a mistake you've made. He says that as they walk away. Irene ignores them and apologizes to Lord Noel for causing such a disturbance. But Noel thinks she shouldn't apologize for any of that, and they should instead head inside. As Irene tries to drink her tea, she still feels awful. She wonders how, when a person hurts you, if you should accept it just because they are family. Noel says he doesn't know the answer to that, but that if she, well, that if he was her family, he would never hurt her. Aw, that's cute. Irene is grateful to hear that, and Noel grabs her head and says that he hopes she, well, wasn't hurt by them. He makes sure to also point out that this isn't him telling her to become stronger, but he just wants to tell her that she shouldn't let other people hurt her because she's more amazing than anyone he's ever met. And he says that he's moving her hair behind her ear. He also points out that there is no one in this world who has the right to hurt her. Oh, I love these two. <laughs> Irene feels like her heart is going to explode. Even mine's going to explode, dude. It feels like she can hear her heart racing, literally. Anywhere that Noel touches her, even if he's just touching her hair, feels like there are nerves inside of her hair that she can feel. He takes his hand softly and says, thank you. And well, it's time for them to get going. Noel is happy and Irene is happy. And he needed to hear her being happy. As Noel and Irene walk down the hallway together, they're both lost in thoughts. Irene wonders if this will be her first time having lunch with Noel. However, she also realizes this is the first time where she doesn't feel nervous at all and actually quite at ease. Perhaps due to the fact that they spend a fair bit of time together at this point. She glances at Noel and notices that he also looks quite relaxed and calm, as a matter of fact. This makes her happy. As they enter the dinner hall, they are greeted by none else than the Grand Duke himself, sitting right in front of them with a meal already on his plate. He asks Irene if she had a good night of sleep to make sure she's all right. Irene, being a bit shy, replies that, she did indeed have a good night of sleep and that she feels well. And she also asks, of course, if grandfather is doing all right himself. But he then also glances over towards Noel and welcomes him to the room too. Noel is nodding his head down, almost like in shame. Oh, a boy shouldn't suffer like this, man. Grandfather asks him to sit down and relax as he has brought food for everyone. The feast is amazing, but all of a sudden, the silence is broken by the Grand Duke. He wonders if he may ask them a question. He wonders when the two of them are planning on holding their wedding ceremony. Irene chokes on her food and freaks out. Oh, oh boy. The wedding question really caught her off guard out of nowhere. She apologizes for choking on her food, but Noel and the grandfather are worried for her, quickly asking her if she needs some water. 
As they say it, they realize they sounded identical. They said the words at the exact same time, which caught everyone off guard, including Irene. <laughs> Who wonders if she needs to perhaps choose between the two of them, because look at them. But she also knows she can't turn down the water if the Grand Duke is one of the one offering it. So she decides to grab the glass of water from him instead. But as she drinks it, we also see Noelle is sad. It bothers him. Oh, I love these two so much, man. And I feel bad for Noelle. She should have just gone for his glass. As they're finishing up their meal, Noelle replies to the previous question and says that the plan is to have the ceremony as soon as possible, but they want to keep the guest list small, but also make the wedding itself as grand as possible. We see why these are the requests that Noelle and Irene have, as they had already spoken about it and planned out to specifically invite only a few people, and that would make sense, as keeping away danger and possible individuals that could harm them would be really important. As to make sure it's a grand ceremony, though, they have to do that because, well, they're the Kirsten family, and, well, they have to adhere to some of their actual values and stuff like that, but they still gotta make sure that the variables and dangers are not there. Irene understands and tells him that she's available if he needs any help, but Noel has something more important that he needs to ask for her. However, back in the room, we see Noel telling Grandfather, I want you to accept Irene into this family. The words run through the room and Irene is feeling sort of worried and is blushing as she looks over at Noel. Irene is worried, as this is something they had never spoken about, but of course the words echo. It's Grandfather. He said, of course. He says that he accepted her the moment she entered their home, and that Irene is someone he knows he can trust. However, in order to marry Irene, the both of them will need the Emperor to sign off on the marriage. And we already know what kind of grim and dark man he is. Noel is worried. The Emperor? He needs his approval? But Grandfather explains. The reason for this condition, and the whole thing where Noel needs to get a wife to marry to get the title, wasn't just to keep hostile parties at bay, and away from the family, but rather also to make sure to keep a pledge that was made 23 years ago, which was created in order to prevent the Kirsten family, their family, from being able to build up any possible army or rebel force that could go against the Imperial family. And as such, the pledge demands that every new addition to the family must be approved by the Emperor. We see a dark, grim image of the Emperor on his throne, staring down on Irene, Grandfather concludes by saying that they can't get married without the Emperor's approval. Noel is furious. That is ridiculous. No other family is required to get the Emperor's approval to bring a new family member, so why do we have to do that? Grand Duke continues and says that it's because the Emperor is fearful of a possible uprising, and it's because a uprising is what put him in a throne to begin with. And he assures Noel that these kinds of restrictions exist to stop any possible conflicts and keep the peace. Because if they don't keep the Emperor and his family happy, who knows what could happen. Possibly even war. But he concludes saying that if he receives approval from the Emperor, then there will not be a single person who will dare to question the legitimacy of Irene. Irene is scared, is fiddling with her fingers. She's never even been to the Imperial Palace before. There were loads of moments where she could have gone, but as she was the eldest of the Chase daughters, she always was left behind, and they would take the dumb bitch Riel with them instead. The Grand Duke says he will send a letter to the Majesty himself today, and that he will also arrange the meeting for them as soon as he can. So, they don't need to worry. Noel appreciates it, but it's clear that his mind is elsewhere, as this whole situation has thrown a wrench into their plans. As then it comes to a close, Irene and Noel both wander away, and they both seem worried. Irene is scared about how things might go with the Emperor, and what if he doesn't give them approval? But Noel steps in and asks Irene, is everything fine? She's a quarter bit of God, but she was totally lost in her thoughts, so that's why. He tells her they've arrived at her room, something which she didn't even realize yet. Noel's face looks concerned. He wants to say something. Next time... Please choose me. Ooh, Irene is confused though. What? What does he mean by that? Before she gets a proper answer, Noelle, with a blushing face, pushes her into the room and jabbers on about needing to go and do some work. Inside the room, Irene is just stunned and confused. What just happened? But also inside, her guard, Roizel, is here asking how the meal was. But before she can even reply to Roizel, 
she realizes what Noelle was referring to. It was about the water. It was the fact that she didn't take the water from him. She can't help it but laugh about how funny and cute Noelle was about the whole thing. Roizel, on the other hand, is just confused. As a new day blooms, we learn that the Majesty has already invited Irene and Noelle to the palace, so the maids are helping get her ready. Noelle is at the door knocking to ask if he may enter. Irene tells him to please enter. As he comes inside, his face is once again all red. Man, both of them are blushing. Irene is in the room and she looks stunning in her golden dress. She asks if it's time for them to head out.